Mr. Chairman, we are live on YouTube. Live on YouTube. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to Select Air. Air Transportation Liaison Committee is the official title, and I'd like to also welcome our airline partners that are going to present today uh, to take time out of a you know busy deal that's going on out there with a lot of problems and a lot of things to deal with. So with that, uh, Kayla, would you like to take uh, roll, please? First, Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebel? Here. Senator Von Flader? Here. Representative Kinner? Here. Representative McGuire? Here. And we do have our alternates, I believe. Uh, Senator Grew? Here. Representative Sweeney? Here. Representative Walters? Here. Excuse me, that's Co-Chairman Walters. <laughs> and Co-Chairman Co. Here. Okay, thank you, thank you Kayla. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, on our agenda first is united with Dan Malinowski, Patrick Manning, and Katie Sweetstar. I'm assuming they're in the waiting room. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I can let them in right now. Okay, let them in. Uh, I would I would like to try to stay on schedule, um, you know, right through to the break. And uh, I know that the people United <laughs> and Sky West are busy and have other things to do. But uh, with that, let's go ahead and welcome the United Airlines status update. Dan Malinowski, Patrick Manning, Katie Sweeser, if you don't know their titles, Dan is... Uh, uh, Managing Director, Domestic Network Planning, United. Patrick is Senior Manager, Western Hubs Planning, United Airlines. Katie Sweetser, out of Denver's Principal Planner, Denver Hub, United Airlines. So with that, who would like to proceed first? Katie, do you want to go first or do you want to start the presentation on behalf of United? Hey, hey, Senator Coe. Um, hey, 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 Dan, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, I think I'll actually kick it off here. Um, okay. And now, do you guys want me to present from my screen or uh, does someone from YDOT want to present? Uh, if you uh, if you want to share your screen, that would be fine with your presentation. If not, you know, just however you want to do it. We've all got the hard copies of it in front of us. Yeah. OK, let me let me just share that. Hey, Mr. Co-Chairman, Senator Coe, can you hear me? Yeah, well, I've got you, Senator Bebout. Uh, you're you're a little bit warbly, but you're there. Yeah, what, what I, I was going to ask is, I'm not being able to see some of the, the people on the video side, uh, Co-Chairman Walters and Representative McGuire, Representative Sweeney or Senator Grew. I don't know if they're allowed in or it's my my internet connection just wanted to point that out to you thank you yeah they're allowed in everybody else is seeing them i think you're having some difficulties with your internet okay okay dan please proceed nice to see you again yeah likewise can you all see the screen yep we got you all right great um well we we put this First uh, slide in here with lots of text, if you guys can uh, read every word of it, but uh, basically it's just saying uh, it's something our lawyers make us put in that basically says we're going to talk about our business and, uh, you know, you shouldn't use it to uh, make any opinions and uh, on things like stocks and stuff like that. So um, I will assume that you all read it thoroughly in the, in the hard copy version. Um, so we have a few pieces here. We're going to go through just a general uh, network update, and then we'll talk a little bit or a little bit more about some other specific network topics, and we'll go into a little bit about uh, just the, the, the latest in Wyoming that we're seeing. So um, kick it off here. Um, if you kind of go back in time to 2016 and you walk your way over the next few years, United was on a, a really nice growth story where um, we kicked off our, our growth plan and um, have been growing faster than we than we really ever had been in the past. Um, and 
then coronavirus happened and uh, we dropped our capacity to very low levels in Q2 of this year. Um, we've been walking that up a little bit since. So we're, we've added a, a good amount of capacity as we go into Q3. And then, um, you know, we're still assessing all of our Q4 capacity plans, but, um, you know, there's some uh, modest increases there as well. And obviously we hope to keep increasing that over time as we, as we move forward. So this is just showing a little bit uh, in this next slide of the TSA checkpoint data. And I think this is a good uh, proxy for what the industry demand is. So this is showing uh, the overall uh, industry TSA checkpoint uh, uh, passengers going through. And so what you see is there was a huge drop off as we went into um, kind of mid-March as the coronavirus really took hold. You know, we've seen some modest <clears throat> increases in demand um, you know, from kind of that low point in April all the way up through late June. And it's, it's really kind of plateaued to some extent, um, you know, since mid-July all the way uh, to where we're at now. Um, you know, we have seen some, there's a little bit of, of a gain in there. So it's not a total flattening of, of kind of the demand growth, but generally it, it's been um, kind of a slower growth in passengers over the last couple months uh, versus what we saw earlier on. <clears throat> and realistically, we don't expect the, to see major changes in demand until uh, we get to a point where there's a vaccine available. Um, and, you know, who the heck knows when, when that'll be. But, um, you know, we don't, we don't see us getting back to normal until that point of a vaccine. So a big part of United's focus over uh, the last six months of this crisis has been um, obviously doing things with the network and um, revenue management and all that stuff. But um, a big piece of it is making sure that we have the uh, cash on hand and the balance sheet in order to uh, withstand this crisis. So a big part of that has been reducing our cash, uh, cash burn. So in 2Q, we reported a $40 million per day cash burn. Um, and that uh, is down to 25 is what we're guiding uh, for the third quarter. So getting our cash burn down is a huge deal for us. Um, obviously the less cash you burn on a daily basis, the, the better you're able to withstand this crisis and um, you know, make it through to the other end. Um, and what you see on the right side here is we've been doing a lot of liquidity raising um, as part of this as well. So we've been getting the cash burn down and trying to get as much cash on hand as we can. So uh, we went from uh, uh, 6.9 uh, billion, billion in liquidity at the end of 2019, and we're expected to have uh, just over 18 billion in liquidity by the end of third quarter. Um, so we think that puts us in a good spot uh, to kind of make it through this crisis, but um, obviously no one totally knows how long it'll last. and um, you know, if some of the trend, some of the demand trends that we're seeing lately will continue to increase, there's just a lot of things that we don't know, but uh, nonetheless, we're trying to get as much cash on hand and lower, lower our cash burn as much as we can to withstand that crisis. And then a, bi a big hey, thing Mr. for us. Chairman, would you like us to ask questions? No. Yeah, that's fine. If you'd like, uh, uh, committee, Senator Bebout, do you have a question? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Co-Chairman. A question for Dan. Boy, this is really showed you what's going on with United. In order to get your daily cash burned down, you obviously you've taken a bunch of flights off of the off the list, and you've parked a bunch of airplanes. Uh, what have you had to do with personnel? Is it part of that? Have you had layoffs, or you are you? Uh, you know, letting people go. What are you doing on the personnel side? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, on the personnel side, we, we are, uh, you know, we, we are having to make some difficult choices. So um, we did kind of earlier this summer, we went through uh, about a 30% reduction in management headcount. So those are people working at headquarters and um, sales offices and things like that. Um, and then, you know, if we don't get uh, a CARES Act extension, we, we do expect to have to make 
pretty significant uh, um, changes to our frontline uh, staffing. So these are, you know, pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, gate agents, et cetera. So we'll be looking at um, a significant number of furloughs to those work groups, assuming uh, we don't get an extension to the CARES Act. Now, there are some deals that we're working on with some of our frontline uh, groups, and we're trying to work through our, you know, options with all of our frontline groups, to try to mitigate furloughs where possible. Um, one example of that is uh, there is a deal that's out to vote with our pilot union um, where they would essentially uh, accept a, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, a pay cut um, in order to keep all of them uh, or, or most of them on, on staff rather than having to do furloughs to that group. And, um, you know, so, so we're trying to get creative and avoid uh, letting people go or furloughing people, but it's just, you know, it's the nature of the business right now is that we're in a tough spot and got to have to get our cash burn low to survive this. Co-Chairman Co. Uh, you're still muted, Co. Senator Von Flater, go ahead. Thank you. Is any of this liquidity um, based on the government, the federal governments? Um, I think they gave you guys quite a bailout for the airlines in general. Is any of this liquidity based on that? Yeah, it is. So we are including basically the CARES Act. Um, it was kind of two pieces. There is. Um, there was a good there was a good chunk of it that was given to us as a grant, which was meant meant to cover uh, payroll basically instead of doing furloughs through September, and then they also gave a portion of that as a uh, as a loan, and then there's a further loan um, that we're able to tap into, um, which is uh, maybe help me on this, Patrick, but I think it was about six billion. Yeah, it, there's just depending on which airlines participate in the program and then how it gets uh, allocated out. I think there's still some questions around that, but it's in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah, it's something like that. And so that is that additional loan that I just talked about is included in that 18, uh, 18 billion dollar amount. Other questions? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, one other one. What percent of your fleet has been grounded because of the COVID issues in terms of number of airplanes? So initially it was a very significant uh, amount and um, we, we have been reactivating aircraft as we've moved along. Um, you know, I don't recall the exact amount that's still grounded. I think it's probably um, 30 or 40% that's still parked. Um, and the reason why we park the aircraft is just there's a lot of ongoing maintenance that you have to do. And, um, and also, you know, sometimes you incur parking charges at airports as well. And so we're, um, you know, we're putting those in storage facilities, um, you know, just to save money on, on the daily maintenance and some of the other expenses you incur. Okay, other questions? Please proceed, Dan. Um, so just a, a big thing that we've been doing um, throughout throughout the last six months is really um, kind of getting, we, we've tried to make the flying experience as safe as possible. And, um, you know, we, we've done that in a few ways where we, we've created our Clean Plus program, um, which is a partnership with Clorox. And uh, we've introduced all sorts of cleaning procedures into the aircraft, um, electrostatic uh, spraying we now have a robot that does spraying in the in the uh <clears throat> in the airplane we hand out uh, uh disinfecting wipes that you can use at your seat um you know we've done just a number of things that we've uh you know to make the the process um you know as uh you know clean and um hygienic as possible we also have the hepa filters on board our aircraft and um, you know, the airflow that kind of goes from the top down to the floor, as well as those HEPA filters really, um, 
you know, neutralize uh, the vast majority of any potential virus particles. So we've, we've done everything we, we think we can just to make it as clean and safe as possible. Uh, I mean, we've, uh, you know, kind of tried to educate our, our customers and passengers as much as we can on that as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, something that was big in our industry was uh, dropping change fees. Um, so we've perm permanently got rid of change fees on uh, all of our domestic flying, uh, as well as you don't see it on here because we uh, had to lock in this deck um, a few weeks ago, but we, we also took away change fees for Mexico and the Caribbean as well. Um, so we, we think that's a big deal for, for this industry and for us, and we're really excited to roll that out as um, you know, something that I think is, is really good for our passengers and, and consumers. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick to talk about the Denver Hub and what's going on there, unless there are any questions on any of the last couple slides. Are there any questions of Dan before we go to Patrick? Are there any questions? Okay, Dan, thank you. Patrick, please proceed, Denver Hub. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to you today. Uh, I'm gonna go into a few slides regarding our Denver Hub, um, and then I'll hand it off to Katie, uh, who will talk specifically about Wyoming service. Um, so if we move on to slide 10, um, what we have here is a summary of our peak daily departures in July, which tends to be the highest uh, number of flights we'll see in an airport um, throughout the year, just given the summer peak demand. Um, and this goes back to 2016 and um, at our Denver hub. And you can see over the last five years, um, culminating with this prior summer, we were planning to, to be at close to 550 departures um, on the peak day, which is a 33% increase um, over 2016. So that's uh, a lot of growth that we've seen in Denver over the last five years. And um, as we'll get into in a, uh, the next slide, that 550 wasn't realized this summer, but um, just speaking about Denver, it's been one of the key hubs for our uh, mid-continental growth strategy that we've implemented over the last couple of years here. And you can really see the importance of that in the number of departures that we've grown um, and then also the destinations served. So uh, as we'll talk about Denver, we is a, um, a key component to our, our domestic network. And um, regardless of the, the, the COVID impact here in the near term, uh, going forward in the long term, it's gonna be a, continue to be a key airport um, for United's network. So if we move on to the next slide, here we have a summary of um, by month since March, the, the daily departures um, are the bars, and then the purple line is the destination served. And then the dotted line is the number of daily departures in 2019, just for reference. So you can see um, starting in April, our network um, at Denver really um, began to take a hit with the impact from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, April, May, and June were the low points. And um, if you recall the TSA throughput um, data that Dan previously showed, that that really aligns with the, the the lull in demand that we saw in those months. But as we've hit the, the bottom um, in the early summer, we started to add back um, flying in our Denver hub. Um, in July, August, September, and October, we've continued to add flights. One of the things I'd like to point out is back when we were at those depressed levels in May and June, um, from a a schedule structure standpoint at Denver, um, we collapse, we normally run multiple banks, um, which are groups of flights arriving and departing at the same time and really contributes to the connectivity at Denver Hub. So we, in March, we're at nine banks in our Denver schedule. And then in April, May, June, we had to pull that down to two banks. And so by consolidating the remaining flights at our Denver Hub, we were able to maintain connectivity to points um, in the Mountain West, West and um, back to the Midwest and East Coast through Denver, um, despite the low level of flying. And as we've reintroduced flying here, we've added back banks um, into our Denver schedule. And uh, 
we've seen the recovery in demand and um, Denver's uh, been a, a leader in our hub performance here over the last several months. Um, and uh, we continue to add flying back, but as you can see, we are um, nowhere near the level of um, daily seats that we were last year um, in October. So we still have a ways to go, but um, we are starting to add back flying and um, uh, continue to maintain that connectivity through our Denver hub. Patrick, I got a question for you, if I could. Yes. I happen to watch Gary Kelly today on CNBC and, you know, you know, competitor, obviously. Uh, and of course, they aren't a hub and spoke operation like you guys are, but he said a lot of the stuff they're doing, rather than nonstops, they're sharing capacity with like two markets, uh, you know, with like one stop service. Are you doing any of that? Um, I mean, we continue to run the hub and spoke model. So uh, running, uh, flights into Denver and then connecting on. So um, we, for Denver specifically, we, we continue to be a hub and spoke um, carrier. We have uh, announced some point to point flying as well. Um, and that's geared towards more of the East Coast destinations down to Florida, but really our bread and butter um, continues to be uh, maintaining this Denver hub and connecting passengers into um, the hub and then onward to um, other destinations. Okay, thank you, Patrick, please proceed. All right, um, moving on to slide 12. Um, we, we have the, the premier uh, connecting hub in the, the Mountain West region. Uh, we like to measure ourselves against our legacy peers and their hubs um, in the region as well. And um, both before the pandemic hit in March um, and then with the latest schedules in October here, you can see Denver continues to be the uh, premier hub in the, the West um, from a connecting perspective, um, both in the peak departures and our total destinations serve. So um, it's something that we take great pride in and um, continue to, to maintain and focus on um, in just in Denver, both from a geographic standpoint, um, the local market, and then the ability to connect um, the mountain destinations and mountain west destinations to and really anywhere in the United States uh, continues to remain a strength for us. Move to the next slide. So what we have on slide 13 here are um, another view of Denver departures. And you can see our, um, the past two summers, so 18 and 19, kind of the, the build up in departures and then where we were this past summer. And so really our, our, our um, focus right now is uh, full recovery to that 555, um, 550 departure um, goal. And as Dan mentioned earlier, we believe that until there's a, a widely um, available vaccine or therapeutic in place that um, we probably won't get back to that level. But once that does become available, our focus will be getting back to the 2020 levels we were planning before the pandemic hit. Um, and then some exciting news uh, about Denver is we are expanding our gate footprint there um, over the next several years. So today we operate about 60 some gates. Um, there's some construction, so that's uh, a little bit um, fluid, but the end state is to have 90 gates at Denver um, on concourse A and B at the airport. And what that'll allow us to do is um, grow our um, footprint there to uh, a target of 700 departures per day. Um, so that's going to be a, both adding additional destinations to the airport and then also increasing our schedule depth. So adding additional frequencies um, to the hub and uh, for the customer and the consumer, that just gives them more options um, to get from their location um, either to Denver or to someplace beyond Denver. So we're really excited about the future prospects of Denver with the additional gates coming on there and the ability that will give us to, to grow the airport further. Mr. Co-Chair. Senator Guru, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Patrick, good morning. Um, and I remember I read that first page really carefully with all those words and stuff. So I'm not quoting or writing anything, but um, right, you know, as of October 20 on this slide, you've got 327. I see full recovery at 550. What right now, 
based on what you've got scheduled so far, what what are you looking at this winter out of Denver as far as a, as far as a departure number, say for December January? Yeah, I think um, we're still uh, our schedules are still under construction, and there's multiple scenarios that we're we're working through. Um, a few things I'll, I'll point out is um, Denver, both um, the local market and the the markets that it serves, continues to have relative strength to the rest of the network. So that has been an area of um, relative more growth um, in our network. And um, as we get into the winter season, um, Denver is the premier hub for connecting to ski and other outdoor leisure destinations in the winter. So I think uh, that really supports uh, additional growth at the airport. Um, Obviously, it's a very fluid situation with the um, number of COVID cases and how those play out as we get into the fall and winter here. Um, so we'll, we'll maintain that, but there's probably some growth higher than that 327. Um, it's not gonna be where we were last year, but um, it, it will we'll continue to grow there. And then I really uh, would say with our, our ski and outdoor destinations, we'll continue to see strength there. And we, we've seen strength um, in bookings in those destinations. Um, and so that'll really support additional growth in, in Denver into the winter season as well. Thank Dan, you. would you like to add on that part or? Senator Grew, do you have a follow-up or is that it? Oh, I, I was, that was it. I wasn't trying to put them too hard on the spot, but I just a little, just see what, see what they were thinking right now. So are you thinking about Jackson a little bit when you asked that question? No, 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 no. <laughs> just, just, just general, just general talk. Okay. Please, <laughs> proceed. <laughs> Please proceed, Patrick. All right. Uh, just Dan, anything to add on the, the winter outlook for Denver? Uh, nothing really to add. Um, I think like one of the issues we have um, is, you know, every airline's kind of uh, shooting in the dark a little bit here. I mean, you know, we, we just don't know what will happen, right? Like we, I think everyone would probably say like, we need a vaccine to be in place before we can see a recovery, but no one really knows when the vaccine's gonna be available. No one really knows how the virus will play out when it gets cold again. Uh, there's just all these things that we don't know. And so, you know, I think all else equal, we would, you know, probably have something similar to the October level of capacity for Denver and, or maybe grow it a little bit. Um, but we just need to see how things play out. And that's why we've been um, putting out our final schedules very close in kind of a couple months out versus where we normally put it out four to five months out. So, um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, we're not trying to necessarily, uh, you know, get out of answering the question. It's just that we, we truly don't know really how all this will play out over the uh, coming, coming months. Thank you. Believe me, I know. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> I have I have one question. Uh, you know, the recovery. Uh, I'm sure you're projecting that the business traveler will will be part of that recovery, and that's that's the real unknown out there, isn't it? Whether or not uh, the business traveler will come back. Yeah, it's it's a huge unknown, um, and. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously it's not going to be zero, but, you know, is it 50% gone? Is it 30% gone? Is it 10% gone? I mean, that, that's the thing that's difficult to know. And, um, you know, every company is grappling with how work from home will impact their business moving forward. And I mean, there's just, yeah, there's just a number of, of factors there that we're trying to get our brains wrapped around. Um, but Obviously, the business passenger is important for uh, for United Airlines. Um, you know, and there's similar questions too around like how does the international passenger return, and that's also uh, a very important customer for us, given that we're more internationally focused than either of our large network peers, Delta and American. So there's a lot of things we're trying to wrap our brain around, um, and if you look at things 
like we, Patrick mentioned earlier, we um, we added some point to point flying to Florida this winter, which is basically flights from uh, Boston and some Midwestern cities to points in Florida. Um, normally we fly all of our flights through a hub, um, but we did this as something special for this winter, which is really a, a reflection of us not expecting the business passenger to be back uh, over the next you know, three, four or five months. Um, and so, you know, we'll keep looking at things like that if, uh, you know, if we need to, but um, we, do, we do expect the business traveler to take some time to recover. All right. All right. Um, and then one last slide um, before I hand it over to Katie. Um, one thing to point out is just our um, mutually beneficial partnership with SkyWest. Um, SkyWest is a uh, operator of United Express flights um, that allows us to access a lot of the destinations in the, the Mountain West region um, that aren't necessarily uh, able to, to be accessed via mainline aircraft. Um, but another benefit of the SkyWest partnership is the, the prorate flying. Um, so this is at-risk flying that SkyWest does um, and then connects into the Denver hub. Um, Denver is by far the hub that sees the most prorate flying um, among the hubs in our network. Um, and so here you, on the right, you can see a map of the destinations that are being served from Denver or will be. We have a few new routes that are starting here in the fall. So even though we have the, the pandemic and um, ongoing, we are able to, um, along with SkyWest, add additional flying into Denver. Uh, one thing that I think the Alamosa date's been um, delayed till November 1st um, since these slides were created, but we are adding four destinations. And then I'd point out on the 11th, uh, starting the Cheyenne Denver service. Um, so excited to, to add that dot to the, the map into Denver. And then um, the the prorate flights bring uh, passengers into um, Denver and then our United's network. Um, and we're able to connect them beyond Denver um, to destinations throughout the, the United States um, if that's where they're, they're going. So one thing um, I mentioned earlier is we are on doing some construction with the gates as part of the gate expansion at Denver. And so some of the gates have been out of service, but um, we are working closely with our um, corporate real estate group and the Denver Air International Airport to ensure that we have gate access as we are working through the, the gate um, construction at Denver to make sure that these prorate flights continue to operate throughout the um, construction phase. So. That's uh, the update I have on Denver. Are there any other questions before we um, hand it over to Katie? Questions from, from anybody of the committee? Of Patrick or Dan? Okay, I think we'll go to Katie. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I will take you through uh, an overview of United Specific Service. Um, to Wyoming and the strength that, you know, Patrick and Dan have alluded to previously. Um, so starting off, we have seen traffic has been very resilient um, over the last 10 years. On the left, we have the domestic uh, passenger traffic, which includes Canada. Um, so we actually saw 2019 was the best year yet um, with all markets seeing an increase in average average daily passenger volumes. Um, so it was reached over 1600 average, average daily passengers. And then on the right, we have the international traffic, which is now up to 65 average daily passengers each way. Um, the other category notably grew um, with the start of United Service to Sheridan, Riverton, and Cheyenne. So that is uh, great to see that coming back to those markets as well as the growth to all of the Wyoming markets. On the, this slide, we've uh, highlighted the enormous strength in the park visitation. So on the left, this goes all the way back to 1950. So you can see how impressively um, the visitation has increased over the past 70 years. But what's also really great to see on the right, um, this is for the May through July visitation the past four years. And 2020 is down only 23% um, versus 2019, which is really remarkable given uh, COVID-19. Um, so this definitely supports the trend we've been 
sort of alluding to about how National Park and Outdoor Leisure were hotspots this summer as people sought out opportunities to travel, to go to destinations where they could um, enjoy their vacation safely. So that um, really supported that traffic growth. And um, just as visitors want to continue um, coming to Wyoming, we want to continue serving uh, Wyoming as the largest airline by daily capacity. Uh, so United now makes up 58% of the total seats in uh, into Wyoming. This is up from 38% in 2010. Um, so we're really proud of that statistic and the growth that we've been able to bring um, to the Wyoming air service market. And now when we look at seats um, by individual market, starting with Jackson Hole, there are a few highlights to point out. So this is broken out um, by hub. Each color indicates a different hub. Um, of course, Denver is the primary service to all of our Wyoming markets, including Jackson Hole. Um, and when you look at it by month, in June, we obviously were at our um, lowest point year over year. Um, in Jackson Hole, but compared to the rest of the system, this is actually pretty strong. So we're only down 74%. But what's really exciting is that in August, our seats to Jackson Hole were only down 25%, which again goes to um, the strength that we saw in the demand to Jackson Hole and um, the other markets you'll see in the next slide. But um, as we continue building back, these will definitely be areas where we're able to focus some additional um, growth and um, keep these service levels higher than the average, just uh, as a testament to how, um, how strong they've been in terms of booking and um, service levels. On the next slide, um, we have all of the other Wyoming markets grouped together. Um, these are all served by Denver. Um, and then the, the line there shows again the year over year uh, level. So that line was where we were at 2019. In June, we were down again the most of all the months uh, so far this year, um, but only 60%, which is again above the system average. And then August again was the highest, only down 18%. Um, and part of that again is the, um, the strength that we saw to national park visitation and um, the outdoors in, as a whole. And so as we continue building back, these again will be areas where we're able to support um, additional capacity, knowing that these are places where our customers really want to fly. Um, these, of course, also include some of the prorate markets that Patrick uh, pointed on. And so SkyWest really controls the capacity there, and we um, work with them to make sure that that is manageable on our end. But um, they'll continue to support that service um, with their at-risk flying. Mr. Chairman, last... question? Yes, Senator Guru, you got a question? Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Key, I'm looking at this slide 20 and, and it really is impressive. The numbers, um, you know, the 60% down, 41% down across the rest of the system outside of Jackson and the, and the strength in that what I was wondering, um, did you notice, was there a, a shortened booking window um, where, where, the, where the, the seats purchased in, the, in, in, these, in these months on a, shorter, on a shorter window? And if so, does that, would that lead you to um, maybe want to adjust that as, a, as, more, as an ongoing thing, as, but just during this uncertain time where you shorten the 21 day window down to seven, 10 days so people, I mean, we've noticed it in Jackson as well, but it seems to be probably true in these areas as well. What do you think? I think that's absolutely um, something we've noticed at, as, uh, at the system level, it's definitely been true. And we've been trying to be very flexible, um, as flexible as we can with um, still being able to respect the, um, the timelines of our, our express partners and the other groups right. that work with our schedules. But, um, as, as much as we're able to, we're really trying to match the demand as it comes in a little bit closer in than our normal process um, is built around. So we were able this summer, um, as we noticed these trends developing, we were able to add additional frequencies on the weekends or upgauge frequencies. Um, 
And especially to Jackson Hole, that was the case. Um, and just going forward into the winter, we're trying to be a little bit more ahead of it on that and sort of anticipate that um, same trend occurring where we might not see the bookings yet, but as we monitor how it's booking closer in and then sort of projecting those assumptions out um, into the winter, we can uh, develop a better schedule around what we can anticipate the traffic would be. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been a shift this year as we've seen the booking window get a little bit tighter. Um, I think right now, now that things have settled out a little bit and it's less, um, less tumultuous as it was earlier this summer, we've seen the booking window start to extend a little bit more. Um, and that's something we work really closely with with our revenue management partners to make sure that we are up to date on and um, have all the information on because um, it is a significant impact on our schedule timelines and um, what what uh, schedules we put together. Well, think if I can, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I yeah, just go ahead, Senator Group. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Co Chair. I I just see these numbers and I know you always help us in Jackson when the winter time with you know with snow levels and all that stuff. It, it's great, but I'm just looking at Cody and all these other. Um, all, all, all this, all the way across the system around the state that, uh, you know, sticking with that, at least in the short term, I know it's tough on revenue management, but I mean, the numbers bear out the strength of these numbers, um, you know, seem to look pretty good in comparison to what we were seeing in the earlier slide. So I would hope that we, um, we could stick with that a little bit as much as you can. I know for as long Absolutely. as you can. Thanks. Yeah, so Casper, I'll point out here as well. So Cody will return to the EIS service, which is sort of dictated by that agreement um, as of October. Um, and then the other ones, again, are SkyWest here on this page. Casper would be the remaining one, which we sort of have more um, flexibility with. And you can see October, we've already included a pretty strong schedule for Casper there, which is almost pre-COVID levels. Um, as a reflection of the strength we expect to see there. And we will continue to you know, update our our booking um, views in terms of how these things are doing, but uh, I absolutely agree with you. There's a, a lot of strength to to meet here in these um, in these markets specifically. Okay, other questions of Katie? Okay, Katie, please proceed. Um, so, in our last slide, this is sort of just a. Um, wrap up slide for us to hit um, again those important points we want to walk away with. Um, so, you know, throughout this entire crisis, it's definitely been a challenge on our whole team um, and you know, as a whole as it is for everyone, but we want to just uh, reinforce our commitment to Wyoming and to maintain um, uh, the premier service that we do um, to all the markets there. And as we, in the short term, sort of focus more on the leisure oriented markets. Um, and that really ties in strongly with Wyoming. So it will be a big part of our strategy going forward. Um, and we expect that to continue for the coming months. And even after this pandemic subsides, I think this will be a trend that endures after the recovery. Um, and people have really um, reinvested in the, the travel to these great opportunities for vacations. Um, and then um, as going back to Denver, which Patrick covered earlier, we do expect Denver to rebound quickly um, and return to that growth uh, projection that we had come into the year with and um, hope to see that return sooner than, than not, um, especially um, on our team. We're excited for that to come back. And as much as we're able to continue that growth, uh, we will do so. And that uh, will tie into Wyoming, certainly in a big way. Um, and we, we look forward to 2021 um, getting back to um, the great levels we were at coming into this pandemic. So we just wanted to say thank you for continued support and we appreciate your time today, certainly. Well, let me tell all of you at United that uh, you know here in Wyoming, we value our partnership we have with you, with our airline partners and, and Gosh, I don't know what we do without United in Wyoming for air service, and and it's been ongoing for a number of years, and and uh, just just really appreciate you taking time to present to us today in a different environment, you know, a new normal. Uh, the legislature saving all kinds of money with these Zoom meetings. I'm not sure if it'll stay that way, 
uh, but uh, are there any other questions from anybody on the committee of uh, our friends from United? Seeing none on the screen here. Kayla, do we have anybody to uh, uh, public comment for specifically the United presentation? Mr. Chairman, we have several folks, but it's unclear if they want to comment specifically on United. I was thinking because of the volume of individuals that may be interested, uh, with your permission, I was thinking we could let folks in, you could do an official call for public comment. And if we don't have any takers, they can just be moved back to the waiting room. Okay, I'll call for public comment on the United presentation before we go to Sky West. Any public comment? Mr. Chairman, I just hit admit, so I think people are just, well, they should be starting to be able to hear you um, any moment. Okay, I see a few people coming on, so. Brian Olson, good to see you. There's Glenn Januska from Casper. Uh, who am I missing? They're connecting to audio for what I show, so. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we, all, we would also have uh, Mr. Butterfield, um, Mr. Hooper, Mr. Belmont, um, Mr. Elwood. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, unfortunately, we still have a, a few folks connecting to audio. Okay, does anybody have, have any public comment for us right now on the United presentation, or would you rather wait till maybe we're done with Sky West or even maybe done with Delta? If you have any comments, please unmute and go ahead. Seeing none, okay. We'll go now to uh, Sky West, Kay Actives and Dan Belmont. Um, please proceed. W welcome, gentlemen. I don't know who wants to start, Greg or Dan. Yeah, you're all set. If you would unmute, Dan, I think we'd be ready to go here. Everybody hear me okay? I can hear you fine. I think they're missing the moment here. Dan and Greg, you need to unmute and then you can proceed with your presentation. Okay, okay, there you go. Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you now, thank you. Excellent. Uh, well, my name is Greg Yatkin, Managing Director. Of you're all set if you would unmute, Dan. I think we'd be ready to go here. So, uh, Mr. Belmont, uh, can you please mute or turn off the YouTube feed? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah you gotta turn off the YouTube moment here how's that that's better thank you <laughs> welcome gentlemen thank you uh, so my name is greg Atkin, managing director of market development for sky west and i am dan belmont manager of network planning at sky west so well thank you for having us and so we'll we'll start going through our presentation and um then we'll uh, proceed from that point Make sure we get this set up properly. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we're good. At least I see it okay. Okay, excellent. So we'll start off going through a little bit of company history and much of this will be familiar to you, uh, but it's a good reminder of, of where we've been. So the Sky West was founded in 1972 in St. George, Utah. So we are coming up in a few years on 50 years of history. And from the very beginning and continues to be true now, uh, SkyWest connects small and medium-sized communities to the global air service network. Uh, today, we have partnerships with four major carriers, 
Alaska Airlines, American Airlines, Delta Airlines, and United Airlines. Uh, our fleet today consists of uh, about 500 aircraft. And previous to COVID-19, we were operating about 2,500 flights a day to 245 cities. Uh, if we look what we're doing now, it's it's about 16 to 1800 flights a day. Uh, and we in 2019, we carried 44 million passengers. So as you guys know, in, in um, Wyoming, there's a, there's a lot of customers that end up flying on a SkyWest aircraft that probably don't even know it. <laughs> uh, wanted to give you a snapshot of where we are flying today. So this is as of uh, last month, this is August of 2020. So even, even despite COVID, we are still flying a, a nationwide schedule across multiple hubs uh, across the nation. So part of that is because, um, because we fly small aircraft, um, we've, we've been able to maintain some of this flying uh, in, just because the, the smaller aircraft is, is advantageous in, in many respects uh, when demand is lower. Specifically in Wyoming, we've, we've flown to Wyoming since at least 1982. Um, as of August of 2020, 57% uh, of the commercial flights in Wyoming were flown on SkyWest Metal. And as of November 2020, which the map on the below left references, we'll be flying to nine Wyoming communities. So this next slide here, it's a little bit busy, but it starts in February of 2015, or actually it starts in January of 2015. And it shows each month between the beginning of 2015 up through August. And it's showing by market the number of emplanements that we've seen in uh, Wyoming airports. And so you can see, if we just fast forward to April of 2020, you can see the the, the employments just fell off a cliff. But the build back uh, has, has, has happened at a rate that's above the national average. So we are seeing the August of 2020 build back, um, you know, at a level that's a little about half, if not a little better than half of what it has been in the past, compared to probably about 30% for the nation overall. So the, this chart, again, the, there's a few different things going on here, uh, but this, this shows just this year in 2020, uh, starting in January up through August 30th. And the orange bar shows the average load factor on SkyWest flights for every uh, month in 2020. The blue bar shows the number of flights per day that we are operating. So you can see if you go at the beginning of the year, our average load factor was maybe 75%, uh, and then it dropped to about 7% in April. And if you look at what it's been doing in, in July and August, it's close to the 50% mark uh, over the July 4th holiday, it got a little above that to around 60%. And then if you look at the flight count, our flight count actually bottomed out in around May and June. And then in July, it, it took a step up. In August, it took a step up again. September, which isn't on here, is very similar to August. Uh, October is, is just a little bit above the uh, September and August levels. So let, let's talk a little bit about old challenges versus new challenges for SkyWest. So previous to COVID-19, our old challenges were recruiting enough pilots, uh, recruiting enough mechanics, and then retaining those uh, professionals in our system. Uh, in addition, sourcing dependable used aircraft was, was also a challenge. I mean, the last, previous to COVID, the last five or six years have been good economic years in the United States. And so air service was growing and, and we, we we continued to source new aircraft and used aircraft throughout that period. 
So if we look at today, what's our new challenges? The, the, the old challenges are not present anymore. And the new challenges are, are low travel demand and uh, the yields are now lower than they used to be. Part of that is because of the business traveler not traveling as much. Um, in addition, there's enhanced safety precautions um, that, that SkyWest has taken and that all of our major partners have taken and making sure that those are all out there and they continue to evolve is, is a significant challenge. And then probably the biggest one from a network planning standpoint is the unpredictable travel demand. Um, what we've seen is there's a significant amount of travel now that books very close to the day of departure. Uh, in, in, in an extreme case, we have one market where 60% of the customers book within seven days of the flight. And so it's, it's very hard to create um, future schedules that, to match capacity with demand when you have a lot of demand uh, that's materializing close in. And from what we've seen, a fair amount of that is driven by whatever the headlines of the day are. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a significant challenge to try to accurately predict what will the uh, demand be in a future month. What we have seen, and United talked quite a bit about this, is that we have seen uh, Wyoming demand recover at a faster rate than the national average. That is true of the Mountain West in general, but I wanted to note that. So let's talk about what has not changed for SkyWest. Our commitment to safety and reliability is as high as ever. Um, if you look at the reliability stats for travel this year, uh, the on-time rates uh, are very high. Uh, this, is, this is operationally a very strong year. Um, and so if for folks that are traveling during this time, uh, the, the, the chances of having a good flight experience on the reliability front is very high right now, which is, which is nice. Um, the number of fleet types we operate is, is unchanged uh, throughout this. We haven't announced that we're getting rid of any fleet types. And the partnerships, having strong partnerships with the communities that we serve, as well as our airline partners we operate for, is unchanged and continues to be the, the bedrock of, of who we are and what we do. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the 50-seat jet uh, and what the future of that aircraft is. Uh, it's a topic that comes up quite a bit, uh, and I want to make sure we address it here. So we have historically operated about 250-seat jets. And by way of reference, Bombardier of Canada, who manufactures these jets, has not made one since about 2007. So um, our youngest one is about 13 years old. Our plan going forward is to operate about 156 of these 50 seat jets. So it is a reduction from what we've had in the past. However, there, there is room to have that number grow um, if, there's op if demand does grow. And uh, the majority of these aircraft will be in our United Airlines partnership. And in fact, a significant number of them will be in the Denver hub. Uh, these aircraft, many of these aircraft have multi-year contracts in place, so we will be flying them for, for quite a number of years into the future. And then we've invested a, quite a bit of money over the past few years into uh, maintenance reliability programs that has allowed us to extend our ability to operate this fleet into the 2030s. So we, we, we feel like we have quite a while before we uh, really have to um, look very seriously at what is the replacement of the 50-seat jet. Um, I can tell you so far what's happened is, is some of the markets on 50-seat jets have been, have been moved up to larger RJs, uh, and that I think incrementally will continue to happen over the next 10 years. Uh, but even with that happening, I think there's a number of markets that will continue to operate on the 50 seat jet for you know well over a decade. So with that, you know our formal presentation is is relatively brief. We wanted to. Can you hear us? I think I think that Senator, that uh, Representative Kinner has a question. 
Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you jump back to the old challenge on the pilot and mechanic yeah. uh, recruiting and retention? And I'm just curious if that's the case, um, that, that that's kind of gone away. I'm curious what factors have led to that, if you could speak on that. Thank you. Yeah, so great question. So if we, I'll talk about the pilot pipeline first. So we, we partner with quite a number of schools that have frankly, a lot of pilots that have been in the, the pilot pipeline to come join to become pilots. And since about uh, March of this year, virtually no carriers in the United States are hiring uh, for pilots. There's a few exceptions with Federal Express and some of the cargo carriers, but the passenger carriers are largely, if not entirely, not hiring this year at all. And so you have a significant number of, of pilots that are uh, have completed their training and that are available to be hired, but there's nobody hiring. So that, that, that backlog continues to increase every single month. So, so that, is, that is one factor that is, that is uh, happening. Another factor, uh, and the exact numbers are still to be determined, but there's a number of carriers that have announced that they are going to either furlough pilots or not hire them for the foreseeable future for the next little while. And so that too is going to continue to build this pilot pool uh, that, doesn't, um, that, is, that doesn't have a place to, to work. And on the, the mechanic side, uh, let me back up one more thing on the pilot side. There has been a couple of, of regional carriers uh, that, that have ceased operations this year. Uh, and so that's another factor going on there. On the, the mechanic side, the, the number of mechanics that we have um, has really stayed pretty steady since early March. We, we, as well as other carriers, have really, similar to the pilots, have largely quit hiring that work group. And so you still have people that are um, coming out of training and are available to work. Um, and then in our case, we're having our attrition levels. We used to have a lot of attrition every month for both pilots and mechanics uh, that they would work here for a period of time. And then a, a career path that would often happen is they would go to a major carrier uh, to continue their career progression. And, and that has not happened. And so our attrition levels in both the pilots and the mechanics is down significantly this year. So does that answer that question for you? Yes, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Senator Bebout, welcome back. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for this internet connection. The question I have is for Sky West is, is, you know, obviously the air enhancement program is a big part of what's going on in most of Wyoming. Uh, several communities don't need it, but mine certainly does. I'd be in Riverton. And, you know, Riverton is, is doing better than a lot, I think, anticipated. And just for your information, we passed a half cent tax for our county to ensure that we have our matching grants as we move forward with that air enhancement program. The question I have is looking at the commitment the state of Wyoming's made, what we made locally at Riverton to have air service. Do you see, uh, I see a long-term relationship between us three and four and five years out do you have any idea, would you agree with that assessment that we're looking at good air service three, four, five years out so we build this market backs up? And if you don't agree with that, what, what do we need to do as a state, not only for Riverton, but the other communities that have to do the matching grant and the importance? Very good question. I'll, I'll, I'll start out with saying that we are, we are absolutely committed to a long-term partnership with, with Riverton as well as the other communities in that program. And I would also add, we're, we're committed to a long-term United Airlines partnership, which, which, is, which goes hand in hand with that. And, you know, I think the way I look at it, and Dan might have a few thoughts as well, is that we are very focused uh, and we look very closely at each of the Wyoming communities. We're, we're very focused on, on making sure that we can grow the markets back. And um, we, we're seeing progress on that front. Uh, you mentioned Riverton uh, has, has, has grown perhaps a little bit more than, than what we expected. And, and we're just hoping to, to build on that strength. Uh, we have regular phone calls um, 
uh, with with folks in Wyoming to help uh, and the and the airports in Wyoming to help uh, assess that level. But I can tell you we're we're committed to the future, and it's something that Dan and I watch very very closely. Yeah, maybe I'll just add to that. Um, you know, if, if we, we go back to when we, we first announced service in Riverton, you know, but before all of this pandemic mess, um, there was so much um, uh, potential there. We saw just in the first couple months before COVID hit, uh, just record levels of, of uh, traffic um, in that community. And as we looked forward to the bookings, they were they were just on a, an amazing pace. So we're, we're looking forward to getting on the other side of this and, and getting back to the true potential that we saw uh, right at the beginning um, with, with a lot of our Wyoming communities. So I've got a question too, to follow up on the capacity purchase agreement that the state has with Sky West. Uh, uh, you talk about Riverton, can you give us an update on Sheridan and Rock Spring well? Yeah, so what Greg had kind of mentioned with keeping close contact with, with Riverton, the same is very true for each community that is uh, part of that agreement. So we're, we're constantly, um, you know, as has been discussed in the previous presentation and, and here, we're, we're watching the demand very closely and we're trying to make um, the most informed decisions that we can um, between us and United and the communities um, and our friends at YDOT trying to, to, to make the best uh, scheduling decisions to, to meet that demand, but also be uh, very conscious uh, of those funds as well. Um, but uh, it's, it's been a great relationship and it's, it's really been, I think, a model that a lot of other communities and, and states have looked at as well. So we're, we're very pleased with it. Well, just to add a, a couple of comments, I mean, what what I think we've seen in Sheridan is the the employment levels in Sheridan um, are the, all of the communities in Wyoming of the smaller communities follow somewhat of a similar path. Sheridan is is a little bit ahead of Riverton, but I think it started a little bit ahead before the pandemic. Um, in Rock Springs, the the employments are just slightly lower than than Riverton. Uh, and so that hopefully that helps give some context between the three communities. Okay, I have another Mr. question. Chairman, one follow-up. Yeah, go ahead, Senator Bebout, then I'll ask mine later. Oh, well, I hate to yield to the co-chair, but I will. The question I have is just in airline traffic in general on the commercial commercial side, you know, a lot of a lot of the potential passengers are just nervous about being, being on an airplane in those close quarters and and you know the precautions you're taking. I know you're doing everything you can as far as making it safe. The question I have is how do you get the word out? What are your thoughts on getting more more information out to the potential flyers so they feel better about flying? A lot of people I talk to just just are nervous about it. It very good question, and it's a very very understandable. I'll I'll maybe answer that question a little bit with my with my personal experience, um, and then I think uh, that can, particularly over this upcoming holiday travel season, I think can be applicable here. So so I took since COVID, the first flight I took was in June, and since June I've now flown uh, on 14 flights between June and the present. And one of the things I think for, for those that have flown uh, it, the, that, you, that you're going to find different than maybe the expectation is, is one, there's a lot of increased safety measures. Uh, the, the air filtration filters on aircraft are, are a lot better than people probably realize. They're, they recirculate the air every few minutes. So it's, it's, it's constantly fresh air in the cabin. The procedures at the airport um, as far as the cleanliness, the airports to me look cleaner than they've ever been. I can I can tell you that the aircraft are cleaner than they've ever been. And um, the the what happens with uh, because masks are required on all the flights. Um, I think that is also another significant layer of protection. So what my experience has been is when you go to the airport, uh, first of all, because there's a little bit fewer travelers than the normal, 
the, the experience at the airport is actually a little more calm. Um, there's, there's not as much sort of the bunching of people to get on the plane and the bunching of people to get off. My experience has been that people have been very conscious about giving each other more space. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the reliability levels this year has been very high. Um, and so I, well, I guess that's a long way of me is saying, I think when people do step out and take a trip, I think particularly in, in Wyoming, um, I think one of the ways that we can help get people comfortable with traveling again is really hearing about experiences from other people that have traveled. And this upcoming Thanksgiving and Christmas period, our estimation is a lot of people are probably going to travel on those two holidays that haven't traveled yet this year. And I think one of the biggest things we could do is to have those people share their travel experience with their friends and their colleagues. And I, I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised about the, the air travel experience. I mean, compared to other things you might do, like the grocery store, I, I would put um, air travel on par, if not higher than uh, in terms of safety than, than doing some of those activities. Anything you add to that, Dan? Um, I would add that there's a lot of great marketing campaigns that we're seeing that focuses on um, uh, all the precautions that the airlines are taking and uh, just reassuring the passengers that, that air travel is safe. So I think it's important that we don't forget that there are still opportunities to market air service uh, as long as we're careful about the message uh, that we're giving to passengers. So it's, it's not something we want um, airports to forget to do or, or, or think that it's not important during this time. Okay, any other questions? I have a question for you. Are you, is SkyWest still on the same acquisition schedule for 175s that you've done historically? Are you still acquiring new new 175s? Yes, we are, but the the schedule has slowed. So, for example, we 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 are taking a about four this fall, which uh, which is planned. Uh, we had another 20 that were planned to be coming into the system between late this year and and late next year, basically over the next year. Those have been deferred for about a year each. And so there there has the the all of the aircraft we had on order are still coming, uh, but uh, the majority of them have been pushed back about a year. as As you acquire the one seventy five, are you phasing out some of the seven hundreds? Believe it or not, no. The, the CRJ-700 fleet, has, we've actually picked up a few used aircraft. Uh, it's, it's a unique aircraft because it has high performance characteristics to go into airports like Aspen uh, in, a, in a way that it can do in a superior way to other aircraft. And so the, the CRJ-700 has, has actually, demand for that aircraft in some respects has, has picked up. Yeah, and I might just add that, you know, we like it here in the afternoon on the United side. We're, uh, they're flying 700 up there most days, and, and it is a great performing airplane here and in Jackson Hole. So, anyway, other questions uh, of the SkyWest people? Any other questions? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes? Representative Walters here. Uh, your November schedule, I see you are going to start flying into Cheyenne. What is, is that a daily flight? Uh, a little more information about that would be fun. Yeah, so we're excited to start that service. It's been something that has uh, been in the works for a while, um, but, but it is indeed starting in November and it will be a, a daily flight to Denver. It, it'll be an overnight aircraft, so it should be very convenient for the community to use. For, for both their business and, and leisure travel purposes. Follow up. Yeah, follow flight, up. Go ahead, Coach Air Walters. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you say an overnight flight, so it'll fly in in the evening and then depart in the morning. Is that the plan for one flight a day? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it leaves at about 7:30 in the morning out of Cheyenne. And then it arrives back into Cheyenne at uh, a little after 9 p.m. 
And if I'm not wrong, that's on a uh, MRG schedule with uh, the city of Cheyenne and the Air Service Enhancement Program. That that's correct? correct. Yep. Follow up. Any other questions of the SkyWest folks? Any other questions? Senator Rue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, first, I just want to say for Dan and Greg, thank you. Uh, it's, you know, I'm glad that the capacity purchase agreement seems to be working for you. Um, I know it's working for us. I, I, I work in for Wyoming. And so I think it's a, it's a tremendous partnership. And I hope you're right. I hope other states uh, take a look at it. Uh, my question, I just wanted to make sure I had it straight that uh, so your entire fleet is uh, are the are the CRJ the 50s the uh, CRJ 70s and E175s. Um, you're not looking to go anywhere else with with your fleet right now, are you? At the, at the present moment, the 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 number of or the types of aircraft we operate looks like it'll be stable. Uh, the part that's that's shifting around a little bit is how many of each. So our 50 seat fleet uh, is shrinking by about 50 aircraft. However, on the other side of that, we're, we're adding back in a few CRJ 700s and then the Embraer 175 deliveries uh, will continue to come as we go forward. And if I follow up, Mr. Chairman, on oh, the, go ahead. The, the 50 seaters, that's the one you have the, the new retrofit where you can go back and reservice those aircraft and get, a, get another 30,000 ops or something like that on, on those planes. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we've extended the life of the 50 seat jet. That's terrific. Well, listen, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions of the Sky West people? Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Mr. Chairman, while the uh, while Kayla lets the folks in for public comment, uh, note uh, the legislative members before we take a break and right after this public comment please stay on we have a little uh, housekeeping we need to take care of so don't rush off for the break and uh, folks on the public please stick around as we like to be as transparent as possible so don't run off prior to the break that's coming up and uh, just wanted to offer that before while the folks were coming in from the waiting room okay if i could get the sky west folks to turn off their screen share We'll go to the, okay, public comment. Do we have any public comment on this particular item, Sky West? Any public comment? Seeing none, um, we're just a few minutes early. We'll go ahead and take a... Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we take this break, I think we have a little uh, legislative stuff we need to take care of. Kayla, could you help us out with that? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do that. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, I would like to turn this over for um, a, a short surprise. I'll leave it at that and let let the surprise speak for itself. <laughs> okay, go ahead, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Jack Skinner. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, I'm the uh, airport manager in Laramie and current president of the Wyoming. Airports Coalition, formerly known as the uh, Wyoming Airport Operators Association. We recently uh, changed our name, but um, I, you know, speaking for uh, the other airport directors around the state, I know that we always appreciated um, this committee meeting and, and getting together in Jackson and, you know, the hospitality that, that uh, Carrie puts forth and and, uh, you know, it's always been an educational um, uh, meeting for us. And, and we know that uh, we have three uh, very uh, important and um, hardworking, outgoing members that we'd like to honor today um, on this committee. These three uh, senators have worked hard for aviation in Wyoming and also aviation nationally. And we, we just want to uh, honor you guys and appreciate the work that you've done. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Kyle Butterfield, who's the public works director in Riverton, and he's got a few words to say, but uh, we appreciate your work and, and thanks for allowing us to, to join you this morning. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Go ahead, Kyle. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, it's my honor to recognize Senator Bebout for his storied and selfless service to the state of Wyoming. In preparing for these brief remarks, I found it challenging to appropriately recognize the Senator's impact, not only in the realm of air transportation, but in all areas of Wyoming. In truth, Senator Bebout's record speaks for itself. For nearly 30 years, he has pushed Wyoming's interests forward and has been involved in several critical pieces of legislation which more recently included the passing of Senate File 40, which as you know, is critical to several communities across Wyoming to have very consistent, reliable, and good commercial air service. This included our own here in Fremont County. Senator Bebout's service in the legislature began in 1987 when he was elected to the House of Representatives. Now I beg a bit of latitude from the chair, but my research team was able to find a photo of Mr. Bebout early into his service. And you'll forgive it's black and white, but we're on a shoestring budget here. So this is uh, Senator Bebout during his service in the House of Representatives. Now it's also interesting that my research team found a similar photo of me during the same period of time. Clearly, Senator to be about service has aged one of us more than the other. Putting all levity aside, uh, Mr. B about service in the house was exemplary and included several uh, important leadership positions, which culminated in his holding the role of speaker of the house. In 2007, Senator B about resumed his service in the legislature when he was appointed to succeed Senator Bob Peck for district 26. This is the position he holds today. Senator Bebout's leadership and work ethic has been exemplary, productive, and respected. This led him to again hold several leadership positions in the Senate, which more recently included being president of the Senate. Senator Bebout is the first in Wyoming to serve as both the speaker and the president, a position which he uh, should hold with honor. While being an accomplished legislator who naturally commands the respect of others, I believe Senator Bebout's greatest strength is his commitment to the people of Fremont County. The Senator is plugged into his community and is approachable. I can give countless examples, but perhaps I'll close by sharing one. My first real interaction with the Senator happened early into my tenure with the city of Riverton. The city was working on a project that includes several community stakeholders and the state of Wyoming. Despite the best efforts of all people involved, this project grinded to a halt and we were at an impasse. Fortunately, Senator Bebout got involved. He was able to negotiate a solution for this project that was agreeable and acceptable to all parties involved. Now, the real story is Mr. Bebout gathered us around a table and said, we need to get this thing solved and resolved right now. What you don't know is that meeting happened on Super Bowl Sunday and I missed the Super Bowl so we get this project done. But I think that speaks to Senator Bebout's character and commitment to the state of Wyoming. Despite it being Super Bowl Sunday, despite it being last minute, he got us around the table and got a solution in place. And I remember one thing specifically from this meeting. He said, this is how we do business in Wyoming. We get things done. Senator Bebout, thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done for the community, for the state, and for air transportation. And it is my honor to recognize you at this time on behalf of our community and the Wyoming Airports uh, Air Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. That's, that's very nice. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Yes, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, Jay Lundell, Airport Director, Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, I'd like to recognize Senator Von Flater, and he, he has been a staunch supporter of the aviation industry throughout Wyoming. He served as a board member of the Campbell County Airport for more than six years and presided as president for more than two years. And so anyway, I've, I've known Senator Von Flater uh, and his passion for aviation since I first met him back in the uh, early 80s, I believe it was. And uh, he was taking flight instruction at the time. So that's kind of where I first uh, met Senator Von Flattern. 
Senator Von Flattern has been supportive of everything from funding requests, protecting aircraft maintenance tax exemptions, and certainly commercial air service. The Wyoming Airport Operators Association could always count on the Senator to do what was right for Wyoming airports and air service for our communities. He has been a strong supporter of all forms of transportation industry, continuously advocating for research into funding and operational improvements. Senator Von Flattern has sponsored and co-sponsored several transportation bills. The most important bill from my standpoint was Senate File 40. This bill established the Wyoming Commercial Air Service Improvement Act, which created the Wyoming Commercial Air Service Improvement Council, of which he co-chaired. Thanks Senator Von Flattern for all your years of service to our aviation communities and the great state of Wyoming. You will be truly missed as a legislator, but your contributions to aviation will forever be in our minds. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else that has anything to say? Uh, yes, I do. Um, Bob, Bob Hooper, go ahead. Uh, this is Bob Hooper. I'm the airport director at the Yellowstone Regional Airport in Cody, Wyoming. And it's my honor today to recognize Senator Coe. When I moved to Cody in 1994, Senator Coe was one of the first individuals that I had the opportunity to meet. Um, Senator Coe has always played an important role in air service initiatives for Wyoming and Cody. Um, most notably, Senator Coe was a member of the Yellowstone Regional Airport Board dating back to 1991 when the Elmer E. Faust Terminal Building was constructed. Uh, Senator Coe has also played a leading role in establishing the Cody Yellowstone Air Service Organization, which later became Cody Yellowstone Air Improvement Resources, better known today as CY Air. Um, this organization serves as the community source for developing and increasing air service to the Cody area and community. Under Senator Coe's leadership of CY Air, we were able to introduce nonstop service between Cody and Chicago on United Airlines. On the state level, Senator Coe has always supported airports and air service being the sponsor or co-sponsor of many important bills related to both aeronautics and air service and enhancement. The Wyoming Airport Coalition would like to thank Senator Coe for his dedication and commitment to aviation and all the airports in the state of Wyoming. Thank you, Senator Coe, for everything you've done to help us. Thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. While we're, you know, I think this is a good time uh, to bring this up. Senator Larson passed away on September 11th. And I had LSO put together a resolution. I'm going to read that at this point in time. We loved Grant. Uh, I mean, just a great friend. Instrumental in a lot of things that we passed down there, particularly he worked hard with me and Senator B. Bout. I'm not sure he was even there then. I think it was maybe the interim, but Representative Illaway, Representative Lockhart, when we passed Senate File 120, Air Service Enhancement Bill, and that was in, I think, 2003. So with that, I'm going to read this resolution. I think it's an appropriate time. I had staff draft it up. The 65th Legislature of the State of Wyoming honors the memory of Senator Grant C. Larson. A memorial providing for recognition of the Honorable Grant C. Larson who served as a senator from Teton County in the Wyoming State Legislature, expressing deep appreciation for city, county, state, and further expressing the depth of our sorrow on behalf of the residents of Wyoming. Be it resolved by the 65th Legislature of the State of Wyoming, whereas Grant Larson served with honor and distinction in the Wyoming Senate from 1995 through 2010, 
And whereas Grant attended the University of Utah and after graduation, he served in the US Air Force as an officer and pilot. And upon his return to the Jackson Hole area, he owned and operated numerous business ventures. And whereas Grant served on many boards and commissions in Jackson Hole and was the county chairman for the Republican party. And whereas Grant served as a committee member on the Minerals Business and Economic Development Committee, Revenue Committee, Energy Council, CSG West, Corporations, Elections and Political Subdivisions Committee, Management Audit, Management Council Rules and Procedures, Select Air Transportation Committee, Select Capital Financing and Investments Committee, Joint Legislative Executive Oversight for the Executive Training Institute slash Graduate School of Business and Transportation and Highways Committee. Whereas Grant also served as Senate Vice President from 2001 through 2002, happened to be when I was Senate President, Majority Floor Leader from 2003 through 2004, and President of the Senate 2005 and 2006. And whereas Grant co-sponsored several pieces of legislation, notably Senate File 120, Wyoming Air Service Enhancement, which authorized the Wyoming Business Council to contract for air service within and outside of Wyoming and was vital for economic development within the state. And whereas Grant was always dedicated to his position in the Wyoming State Legislature and his dedication carried over to others who worked with him. And whereas Grant C. Larson leaves behind his wife, Marilyn and two adult children. Now, therefore be it resolved by the members of the legislature of the state of Wyoming that we express our profound sense of loss created by the passing of our beloved friend and leader and extend our sympathies to the family of our fellow legislator and dedicated public servant. Be it further resolved that a copy of this memorial be transmitted to the family of Grant C. Larson, that they may know the sense of sorrow and loss suffered by the people of Wyoming by virtue of his passing. Signed on the 17th day of September, 2020, Senator Drew Perkins, President of the Senate, and Representative Steve Harshman, Speaker of the House. So that's the resolution, and I had that drafted up, and it's very appropriate. Uh, we're going to miss Grant. He passed away on September 11th. Uh, if you get a chance, there's quite an article in the Jackson Hole News and Guide today that talks about Grant's life. So I don't know if Senator Bebout has any comments. Chairman, we seem to have lost Senator Beba on the video for now. Okay, uh, Senator Garou. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Grant Larson was a good friend of mine. Um, while at times we were political adversaries, I can tell you that we were for several years. I never laid a glove on him and he beat me senseless more times than you could count. And so when someone beats you up politically that bad that many times, you get a lot of respect for a fella. And I had all the respect in the world for Grant. Um, in addition to the things that were mentioned there, he served with distinction on our airport board uh, for many years and, and is, is, is responsible for many of the improvements and laid the groundwork for the uh, airport that we have today. And I know when we talked about passing um, the capacity uh, purchase agreement in the legislature, we talked a lot about a lot of different things. And I recall I was in the house at the time and, and uh, Representative Walters remembers this, um, you know, we got out, I got up and gave a little speech and we were kind of wondering if someone from Jackson should, but I did that one for Grant because I can tell you that um, when Grant Larson was uh, chairman of our Chamber of Commerce, he and a small group of folks like Clarine Law and a few other folks that some of you know, um, got together and at that time this Jackson had an overnight stay um, rate of one night. People came here, stayed one night, and left. They were either going to Cody to see uh, to see uh, Senator Coe or had just seen Senator Coe and Cody and were on their way back. Um, and so that's kind of the way Jackson was, just a one-night stop. And Grant and a few others got together and said, hey, we're going to turn this into a world-class destination resort. Today in Jackson Hole, the average stay is close to seven nights. 
and it wasn't for any other reason. And I tell this to folks all the time as far as economic development in the state. It was people like Grant Larson who just got up and said, that's what we're going to damn do. And they damn well did it. And, you know, while creating events and just getting the whole community behind it. And it's the power of what can happen when a small group of individuals decide to do something. And it can happen in every community in this state. And Grant Larson is a testament to that. And that's why we honor him today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Very well said, Senator Gru. And I, gosh, I don't know if I had a better friend out there than Grant. And my sympathies to the family and great accolades. Anybody else like to make any comments? Senator Bebout. Senator Bebout, if you would unmute. Uh, do you have any comments on Grant, on, on the resolution and everything that he's done? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just finally got back on. I changed locations. Uh, would you please ask that question again? I just turned it on. Would you ask it again, if, please? Well, we just read, uh, Senator Bebout, we just read a resolution drafted up honoring Grant Larson and uh, all of his work on, on air service and all of his work in the community of Jackson, his community, the state, all the things he meant to everybody. And so we're, I just read that resolution signed by uh, President Perkins and Speaker Harshman. And I just wondered if you had any comments on Grant Larson. We just had some great comments from Senator Guru ask if you have any comments because you and I were, and Senator Grew were very, very close to this gentleman. Oh, oh well, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. And I'm, I'm sorry I missed what Senator Grew had to say, but but uh, Senator Larson was just, uh, <laughs> he was an incredible gentleman. Uh, I served with him both uh, in the Senate uh, when I was came back and he was my chairman of minerals. Uh, and then of course, when I was in the house, going through leadership in the House. He was in the Senate with you, Senator Coe, and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting times and, and Grant was always pulling tricks on me. And of course I was more, you know, I was so into doing what I wanted to do with the House. He, he actually did some really funny things, but we worked really well together. Wyoming is a much better place because of Senator Larson. His commitment to his family, his commitment to his community, to his friends, to the legislature, it's, it's just, uh, he's not replaceable. And Senator Grew's doing a great job and nothing against Senator Grew, but uh, Grant was so special and such a great friend and boy, is he going to be missed. Uh, we're so lucky in Wyoming to have people like that. And I, I'm looking at the screen here and, and all the elected officials, those that work for the state, uh, I, I see a lot of people that share that same commitment and love of public service and and love of their communities and love for Wyoming. And I think Grant Larson was just uh, right at the top of that list. Uh, he was a real mentor to me. Uh, for uh, General Reiner's uh, years ago, and of course I'm an anti-tax guy, but I rode with Grant from Cheyenne to Jackson. And by the time I got there, I was uh, not only willing to vote for the one grass tax he wanted, but more. That was the kind of guy Senator Larson was. And, and so uh, thanks, um, Senator Cole, for allowing me to share a few words. Uh, but not a, a day hardly goes by that I don't think of Grant and Marilyn and their commitment, love of Wyoming. We're so lucky, so blessed. Thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Senator Bebout. I'll, I'll just tell one, one quick story on Senator Larson. I went to an Energy Council meeting in Anchorage, Alaska and arrived in Anchorage the night of September 10th, 2001. And I got out of there a week later. And of course they canceled the Energy Council meeting and Grant Larson stood up on the floor one day and he said, I want everybody in the body to know that Senator Coe went to Anchorage, Alaska to attend a meeting and the state paid for it. And he never went to one day of any meetings up there. And I want the body to know that. And everybody chuckled and, and you know, that's the kind of guy he was. He had a great sense of humor. He just was a marvelous man. And Jackson and the Jackson Hole and the state of Wyoming is much better place because of what Grant Larson contributed. So with that- uh, Mr. Co-Chair, 
Yeah, Mr. Co-Chair, one, one last thing I'd like to share. And, and in the Senate, when we were on the floor debating, you and Senator Larson were in the back of the room and I was in front and we would, uh, I was carrying the uh, Ag Committee's bills. And of course, Ag, you know, is a big part of the Ag Committee, obviously. And, and we, we try to do what's right for our Ag Committee and there are exemptions in there. And, and Senator Larson and I would always have this great discussion about exemptions for Ag. So I told him one time, I said, it's all set up, Grant. We can get you Ag Legislator of the Year and you only have to do one thing. And he said, well, what's that, Eli? And I said, just carry a bill to say Ag is exempt from everything. <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he wouldn't do that, but uh, that, was, that was Grant Larson. And uh, we remember the good times, but boy, I, I, I have a tear in my eye when I, I think about him. So thank you. So do I, absolutely. And I would encourage everybody to read the great tribute to Grant Larson and the Jackson Hole News and Guide that came out today. At, at least I just saw it on my computer and, and marvelous man, marvelous man. So uh, with that, if there's, if there's no further comments, I have 1012, uh, we'll take a, uh, we'll come back in at 1025 and continue with, um, I believe we have aeronautics up next with uh, with General Reiner. So we'll take uh, we'll be back in at ten twenty five.
Co-Chair Walters, I'm going to let you chair if, after we all get back in here. Sounds good. I'll be ready. Mr. Chairman, should we get started and let, uh, looks like Representative Sweeney's back, so I think we can get started. You Are you okay with that, Mr. Co-Chairman Coe? Absolutely, Co-Chair Walters. I think we've got the troops rounded up. Um, we still got Guru there, I see him, Eli. Then we can, we can do something. We've got those two. Yeah. yeah. All right, with that, I think uh, we're on to a presentation from YDOT and we'll kick it off with uh, Director Reiner and you can lead the way and let us know how you wanna proceed. As we go, I think we will ask questions as, the pre as your uh, presentation proceeds just so that they stay fresh on the members' minds. So with that, uh, Director Reiner, you're up. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, and, and we'll certainly, you know, we will welcome questions as we go through this. Um, I, I tell you, uh, what I have is just a, a couple uh, opening comments uh, before we, uh, I kick this uh, to my team. And uh, Mr. Burke is, uh, is bringing up the slideshow as we go. Um, you know, before we get probably into this formal presentation, though, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I appreciated the chance for being on here for about the last 30 minutes and really uh, watching some great uh, senators um, be recognized uh, for their service. And, uh, and I appreciate the tribute to, uh, to Senator Larson. Um, I, I tell you, you know, on a personal note, you know, leadership matters. And uh, as, as I listened to the stories of, of you know, Senator Larson, I, I never had the, I never met him, obviously my loss, but there's three other uh, gentlemen who I have met and worked with and I respect greatly who are who are leaving our service. You know, this is my uh, 11th, I think my 11th year uh, being involved with uh, the state legislature, just, you know, between the military department and now YDOT, and certainly have never known uh, the legislature without, you know, a co or a bebout or a month later. And, uh, and that, uh, the loss is tremendous. You know, you just know for all three of you that it will be felt uh, throughout. And, uh, you know, von, uh, Senator Von Flader has been my chairman for, I don't know how many years. And uh, so it is, it's certainly, um, you know, with uh, a loss and uh, we'll, we'll thank, we'll thank more in the future, but uh, just know that your service uh, for all three of you is noted and your mentorship and leadership and vision for the future, you know, is felt uh, throughout the state and will be felt uh, for many years. I tell you, on uh, uh, as you as you flip to these opening comments from Reiner, um, you know, the first thing that you talk about there is the effects of COVID, and and it goes back to some of the discussion that was involved with uh, you know with this committee on both uh, the Air Service Enhancement Program and the Capacity Purchase Agreement. Because what you will see as you hear the comments from um, you know, Administrator uh, Olson and Sean Burke is that our state has done really well in air service as we've weathered uh, this thing that we did not see coming in terms of COVID. And, and a large part of that success is directly um, applicable to both of those programs that we talked about. And so, uh, you know, my congratulations, and again, thanks and hats off to everybody with the leadership and foresight um, to make that happen. And I know that was a big team effort of, you know, the select air, um, but, but we're better off because of it. Um, in, in terms of other effects of COVID, you know, I just take a couple minutes to talk about, you know, YDOT and, and your largest state agency. 
is about 20% of us now are, are teleworking. And I, I don't see that change. And, you know, most of our force can't telework. Uh, but those of us that can, you know, many of, uh, many of us are. Uh, the senior leadership, we're, we're at 50%, really took the team, the senior team, split them into two. And, uh, and we're a week, week at home. Uh, and then a week in the office. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, one of the one of the lessons you sort of learn over life is you never put all your leadership in one aircraft. And and I certainly took uh, took that to heart when we started talking about COVID and how we make sure we're uh, we're set up for success. I did not want to tell the governor, you know, or any of you that all of all of White Out leadership was down. Um, we, I, you know, we thought we might get through this COVID thing, you know, with all our internal controls and social distancing and masks without being affected. But I've lost count of the number of employees in YDOT that have been affected. So, um, you know, we're probably between 20 and 30 at this point. And our battle drill for deep cleaning and, and making sure everybody else is safe is actually is actually pretty good. Uh, the the good news story is, if there is one there, is the infections have really come from the outside. So a lot of times it's been family members. and uh, But the social distancing we have in the organization has prevented a mass outbreak with our employees. And, and so my my thanks to my uh, my leadership throughout White Out for, for making sure that happens. Um, in terms of CARES Act and covid you know, the quick update to this team would be um, really the biggest success has been in aeronautics. Um, of the 1.25 million that we received as a state, um, uh, certainly uh, the uh, about 4.15 million came back to YDOT to reimburse uh, the capacity purchase agreement. So that, that was a good news story. And that applied to locals. And, and communities because we took the approach of, hey, we're all in this thing together and we'll take the lead in requesting uh, CARES funding to be reimbursed at all levels. So that was a good news story. The other the other money we've received is about almost a million dollars, I think about 900K, uh, really for the transportation actions that we took and continue to take now periodically uh, around the state. So we're moving PPE and we're moving samples and. And, and that type of stuff. And so that's a reimbursement for that. We did ask for lots and lots of money in terms of Wirelink and broadband support. Those were all uh, basically denied um, based on, hey, we don't think that that fits uh, the CARES Act reimbursement. Cumulatively, um, when you look at traffic across the state, um, we're, we're almost back up to where we were uh, before COVID started in, in numbers, uh, we're a little bit down. But what we track is the cumulative effect since it started. And we compare it for the last three to five years, a running average. And we're about 10% uh, below in that cumulative uh, numbers. Uh, so uh, the effect on this year's budget, which for us, as, as on a federal fiscal year ends here in you know, about a week, is about $7 million. As we plan for next year, we're, we're planning about a $21 million hit uh, for our next fiscal year based on, based on the effects of COVID. In terms of construction, we are winding construction down. We are at a high of about 90, 90 uh, construction projects. We're down to about 72 now and, and, and getting ready for winter ops. In terms of budget, um, we did spend a lot of time um, with my crew and then working with our transportation commission and then our transportation committee, uh, developing a bunch of guiding principles uh, as, as really we, uh, you know, see as we've been under budget crunch, you know, before COVID and then COVID certainly exasperated it. Um, you know, our, our priorities very much are um, a, let's make sure we spend the money correctly. Two was um, key uh, safety initiatives three was preserving our assets and then then there's there's some more and and at the very bottom then was new uh capacity and mobility projects because we, we just don't have money at this point to do that and so very much focus on asset preservation thus you see things like us delaying um about 11 big projects around the state um uh, based on this this budget issues that we've got so 
Uh, we've also certainly taken effects like um, close and rest areas, uh, starting to look at, hey, we need to go back to our old snow plan uh, that probably doesn't plow as much snow as we currently plow. All of those things have been really very, very painful uh, decisions as you look at, at, at where we're going. The, um, the FMR that's received directly goes to fund aeronautics. And so that money in terms of our budget remains very, very important to us and very important to the success of, of aeronautics. Uh, on the federal side, uh, it looks like a continuing resolution will come into play and it looks like we'll get a year extension uh, for the, the, the act that funds our highways. And so that's good news to us and it's really good news to our contractors because you sort of have a good idea of how much money is coming in. The other good news there is that it looks like the federal government will actually replenish the highway trust fund, the federal highway trust fund, which was scheduled to run out of money in like March or April. And, and that would bring a whole nother set of, you know, complexities to our, to our life. So that's a quick update on budget. In terms of upcoming challenges, um, certainly uh, we are working uh, to uh, retain our most important asset, our employees. Uh, we're working to professionally develop them. And, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the men and women that work for YDOT and that provide uh, all of the services that are, are felt across the state. You know, legislatively, uh, we're working hard on an alternate revenue source, you know, under the, uh, the guidance of Senator Von Flader. And in fact, we uh, just yesterday or the day before, um, uh, took a serious look at a road user charge, which which our recommendation to the committee was, hey, in the long run, we see this as really the best revenue sources out there. Uh, the committee agreed and 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 voted a bill forward. So we'll continue to to work that. Uh, autonomous vehicles uh, is a is an upcoming challenge to us, uh, both on the roads and and certainly coming in the air. Uh, as as you start looking at increased use of drones, and and there's you know there's there's others, but those those are the big ones that that I would address. And and with that, Mr. Chairman, that's some some short opening comments. Look forward to the discussion on air service, but but I always think it's important just to take a moment and talk about you know the greater Y dot and and how things are are going. Um, I'll stand for any questions on this, but I'm certainly ready to hand it over to Administrator Olson to continue. Uh, the brief. Senator Bebout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, if you would allow me to ask a question more from my perspective as working with you and, and Representative Kinner on the Appropriations Committee, talking about your, your budgets, General, and of course, you, you know, you are outside our purview in terms of what we do in the, the budgeting process. Uh, what do you, when you look at your budget and your number, and you know, one of the things that has always driven what we try to do with YDOT, and I know you're a big supporter of that, is to try to ensure that we have the money to take care of our roads, not only the maintenance, but uh, and to look at how we, the new roads we might be building. And as you look at the shortfall and budgets and all that's going on, have you targeted a, a, an across the board or a percent decrease in anything when you do your budgeting? Uh, maybe looking at some furloughs, uh, anything like that in terms of how you're running YDOT? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as Senator Bebout, I'll tell you, we have been uh, continually uh, reviewing our budget and, and cutting. In fact, uh, we're probably about 10% below uh, where we are normally in a fiscal year today uh, in terms of percentage of money that we've spent and so, so the guidance was, hey guys, we are cutting back uh, across the board. Um, our, in terms of employees, you know, we're 10% down of where we were 10 years ago. Um, we delayed purchasing a, a significant amount of rolling stock uh, because, because we can afford that. Then, you, then we've really taken a look at a lot of the operational side. You know we closed some rest areas. I'm sure you've heard about it. You know, and, and that was, you know, carefully calculated on which ones to close based on proximity to, you know, other uh, services. Um, we, we delayed the significant construction projects so that we can put money into, into our asset preservation. You know, the trend right now with our roads is that 
the the good the percentage of good roads is decreasing and the percentage of bad roads is increasing and and i think as uh, I think those are trends that are not helpful for us as we look at our state economy and know that everything we do rides on roads. And 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 so uh, it is critical. Uh, we're really cutting across the board to try and push money into into preserving our, our assets. And and so, Senator, that that's uh, has been a across the board review and. Uh, we'll continue to do that in in an effort to be as you know efficient and effective with with the money that we do have. Um, over. Any other questions for Director Reiner? All right, I'm scrolling here, not seeing any. With that, uh, we'll move on to you, Administrator Olson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Uh, good morning and good morning to all the other committee members as well. I'm Brian Olson, as uh, Director Renner mentioned, Aeronautics Administrator for YDOP. We appreciate the opportunity to update you on the state of air service in Wyoming and nationally, as well as on some of uh, the other work that we've been doing over the last year. And I just want to take a minute, uh, you know, on behalf of the Aeronautics Division and the Aeronautics Commission, um, and me personally, I just wanna add our thanks to Senators B. Boutko and Von Flatern for all they've done to strengthen aviation in our state. And uh, it's both for us and for future generations. Um, and their foresight, service and dedication are greatly appreciated and we're gonna miss them. As others have laid out uh, before me very well, the challenges faced by the aviation industry this year have really been without precedent. And um, I think the good news uh, side of it is that even though those challenges have been very significant, uh, we've worked uh, very proactively with our partners uh, specific to air service to mitigate our exposure to the financial effects of COVID-19 and at the same time retain quality air service and retain our ability to connect to the uh, national airspace system. Uh, fortunately, we've had some excellent tools at our disposal to help us through this crisis, tools like the Air Service Enhancement Program and the Capacity Purchase Agreement. Uh, they've been made possible, of course, by you all, and uh, we just we do want to say thank you, and, and we appreciate those tools that we've had. Um, while the challenges have been significant, we're working through them. Uh, we intend to come out the other side in a strong position uh, to face the future and, and the growth that'll happen in air service in Wyoming. So Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll turn it over to Sean Burke, our Program Manager for Air Service Development. He'll provide us uh, with an update on air service, and then I'll follow up with a few comments on some other aviation related topics uh, with your permission. Sounds good. Please, please proceed, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had four kind of core topics I wanted to, to update the, the committee on. Today, the first is uh, statewide figures from 2019 heading into 2020, uh, kind of segueing into uh, the COVID-19 impacts to the state, uh, and then an update on the Air Service Enhancement Program expenditures, uh, as well as the Capacity Purchase Agreement, uh, the, aka the Commercial Air Service Improvement Act. Uh, and then Administrator Olson will go ahead and provide an update on uh, the Airport Improvement Program and some of the, uh, the, the capital improvement projects going around the state. So Mr. Chairman, 2019 was a record breaking year for the state and it was not just a record breaking year, it was, you know, kind of shattered uh, the previous record breaking year in 2018. Uh, the state was up 15.5% in total passengers from 2018. Um, so, you know, phenomenal success. Uh, 2020 was looking even better with the capacity purchase agreement entering full swing in early 2020. Um, so we're really optimistic about what was going to happen in 2020 off, off the heels of an incredible year in 2019. Um, and when we look at you know, 2019's growth, uh, Wyoming was the fastest growing state uh, in the country in terms of passenger employments. We were up 14% in passenger employments uh, versus the national average of, of 4%. So great story you know, that, that was happening here. 
Um, and if you look at who is kind of leading the drive on that, it's, you know, it's no surprise that uh, Jackson uh, kind of took the cake in, in terms of total passengers in the state uh, with, a, with a huge gain from 2018 to 2019. Um, but if you look at, at just about every other airport in the state set a record um, or, or increased their pad total passengers from 2019 over 2018. Uh, if you look at Cody, it was a record year for them. Uh, Casper was getting back up to 2015 numbers as United started to add more capacity back uh, to Denver. Uh, Cheyenne reinstated service uh, with, with service on, on American Airlines operated by SkyWest at DFW. Uh, Gillette came back into the, the capacity purchase agreement in, in October and had um, a record-breaking fourth quarter. Uh, Jackson, again, a uh, phenomenal increase. Uh, Laramie's been a pretty good story that's been happening. Uh, they've been served by SkyWest uh, with CRJ 250-seat uh, aircraft for the last five years, and it's just always been this kind of incremental increase uh, year over year, uh, which has been great to watch. Uh, Riverton and, and later Sheridan, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get to as they came into the capacity purchase agreement. Uh, and then Rock Springs, you know, kind of the same story, just a, this incremental increase as we've been starting to, to really make some inroads and in winning back passengers uh, in airports that were formerly served by um, a, a Great Lakes Airlines. So kind of continuing on, I wanted to take a look at, at just how much passenger share Jackson takes of the state. Uh, Jackson is attributed 64 uh, 0.4% of the total passengers in the state, uh, a relatively big number. Um, and everybody else kind of bundled together there towards the bottom. Um, but I went ahead and took Jackson out in this next slide just to kind of give a sense of, of where the other airports kind of stand on it. You see Casper's um, uh, through 2019 was 14.2%. Uh, proportionally, they've gone down since 2015 just because Jackson has, has gained so much passenger volume. Uh, you got Cody and in a third place there with just about six percent um, and then some some kind of some movement going on with uh, with Cheyenne uh, as a reinstated service um, in in late 2018. Moving on Mr. Chairman um, this you saw this data in kind of different format from United uh, this shows the the percent of departing seats by airline within the state um, and what I wanted to show here was United has gained pretty much at Great Lakes' expense as Great Lakes uh, defined from, from 2019 into to 2017, early 2018. Uh, United has picked up the bulk of the share there. Uh, no surprise, it's, it's service to Denver is what it amounts to, to so very similar to what Great Lakes was doing uh, just on you know, larger aircraft. Um, then you can see some, some inroads by American kind of in 2019 into 2020, uh, as they've added a little bit more capacity back into Jackson, uh, and then a little bit there for Cheyenne. Mr. Chairman, getting into it kind of what, what COVID-19 has done uh, for the state, this is looking at the first six months of the year, so from January to June uh, only, and kind of the percentage change of what's happened. And cumulatively, uh, that six month change in 2020 from 2019 was down 45 and a half percent. So you had a re record breaking 2019. We were really, really optimistic about what 2020 was going to look like. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit. And uh, I mean, this, this graph kind of speaks to, to exactly what's kind of happened is, is traffic evaporated here a little bit. Um, and what it, wanted to show with this graph is to show just kind of how seasonal uh, particularly Jackson Hole is. Uh, you have ski travel, it drops off towards the spring months, comes back in the summer months, again drops off towards the uh, the late fall months, comes back again for for the um, the ski season. So there's a, there's a normal drop that happens around April as is, um, but you see just everybody kind of falling off the cliff there towards April. Um, and then there's a lot of talk about, you know, the U shape and B shape recovery, uh, which you see in Jackson is very much a B or U shape kind of recovery of people coming back into the state to, to seek out our wide open spaces to, to come visit and uh, pursue recreation. 
So I did the, the same graph kind of taking Jackson out of it. So you can take a look at some of the other airports here. Um, Casper and Cody uh, have shown some pretty good rebounds from, uh, from COVID. Uh, some of the airports, some of the other airports, uh, a little bit slower to come, come back, but uh, traditionally a little bit less volume. Uh, so that's kind of to be expected. Uh, getting into the, the aircraft fleet mix, and what I want to kind of show with this one is um, just in the U.S. how the fleet mix has changed. Um, traditionally, I mean, you had uh, some wide body aircraft mix in there, but the bulk of flying was done by narrow bodied small uh, aircraft such as 737s, A320s, A319s, things like that. Um, you can see after May, the proportional amount of flying done by regional, large regional jets, which are your Embraer uh, 175s, 170s, uh, 76, 70 seats and up, um, has, is proportionally larger than it had been historically. And I think that's directly reflective of there's not as many people flying, so there's not the need for the bigger aircraft. However, uh, the airlines still want to maintain frequency. They still want to main, maintain hub schedules. Um, so they need to maintain uh, more, more aircraft really flying uh, proportionally than you know, what, what was occurring uh, in, in, 20, in 2019. And kind of doing the, the same chart for the state, this is to show just how much uh, we're really dependent on small regional jets, 50 seats and under. Um, and you know, that's not gonna change too much going forward, uh, but you can kind of see that the narrow body small, uh, the, so the 737s, 8320s, uh, really dropping off in April, May, June, uh, coming back in in July and August as airlines added capacity back into Jackson. Um, to, to bring all that visiting traffic back in. But, you know, the, at the end of the day, we, we're reliant on uh, regional jets to a number of our smaller airports. And Mr. Chairman, taking a look at some of the booking trends, at least through August, uh, nationally, leisure traffic uh, is down 77%, which, you know, in, 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 in any other year would be uh, horrific. But you compare that to, to corporate and business traffic, which is down 89%, uh, doesn't sound uh, too bad. Uh, in Wyoming, our leisure traffic is down about 37%. Uh, corporate business and corporate and business travel is down about 70%. Uh, interesting stat here, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, visiting traffic right now in Wyoming is responsible for about 93% of, uh, of our current traffic. So for every one person, one resident of Wyoming that gets on an aircraft, there's typically about 15 that come to visit Wyoming. Uh, and you compare that to 2019, the share was a, a six to one over the same period. So uh, the, the share is very much moving towards uh, visiting traffic coming into Wyoming. Mr. Chairman, this is a this is a chart from uh, Airlines for America, and what I kind of want to draw your your attention to here is the is the blue line, uh, in that Wyoming had the smallest decrease in total passengers in July of 2019, or excuse me, in July 2020 compared to 2019. Um, so you heard it from United and SkyWest, the mountain region in general is doing better than uh, most. Uh, most states. However, Wyoming's doing the best of, of the mountain states. So that's that's something nice to, to kind of hang your hat on a little bit. And uh, but these slides went to print before we were able to update it with the August 2020 numbers. Uh, and in August 2020, Wyoming is, is still the most recovered state uh, in the country. We've recovered about at 60% of our total traffic uh, compared to the national average, which is which is right around 50 something percent. Mr. Chairman, looking at some short, medium, long-term impacts of, of what COVID-19 is going to mean to Wyoming, um, the traffic that's coming back is all based on, on leisure traffic. You heard that from, from the major, majority of the airlines here. Um, there's going to be some fall seasonal reductions as there's a normal drop-off in the fall as is. Uh, this downward pressure on fares is, is something that the, the airlines are watching particularly closely. Uh, we should be watching it you know, relatively closely. Um, because that's going to affect uh, the economics of smaller aircraft, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, medium term, we're looking at it, probably a small increase in business traffic that's that's supposed to return. 
Uh, total capacity reductions in the state is, pro is likely to, to be down about 30 to 40 percent from 2019. Uh, it's, just, it's trending more towards the 40 percent side as is. Uh, again, the downward pressure on fares. Uh, long term, it, an unknown kind of aircraft availability. There, there is some consolidation happening around uh, regional aircraft providers uh, and uh, Transstates Airlines and um, ExpressJet. So the options for operators of 50 seat aircraft um, are, are declining. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, this backstop with SkyWest and a great working partner with SkyWest um, and that the CPA is, is there in place, the framework is there um, to prevent us from it losing service in some of these airports. Um, kind of going back to this, this reduced fare uh, issue, it's it, small aircraft are in general relatively inefficient to, you know, your, your 737s or your 320s. So typically you need higher fares to kind of offset that. Um, if fares don't come back and, you know, it's kind of significant uh, increases, uh, then it's, it's likely that small aircraft retirement will be uh, sped up. Um, small air, airports at the end of the day are the mo most at risk for this. Uh, American announced that they're going to suspend service to a couple of airports, Delta United, and I think, I believe United have, have announced that they're going to suspend service to some airports. Uh, those airports do already have service, but they're seeing a consolidation in, in the number of air service providers that they have. Uh, a little bit more post-COVID-19 impacts. Like I said, the small airports are, are the most affected. Uh, there's going to be a handful of airports around the nation that are going to be left with no air service after October 1st, after the CARES money expires for some of these airlines. Um, yeah, they didn't have a, a capacity purchase agreement essentially to, to kind of or at least the framework to provide a backstop. Um, and in, in some of the things that we, we conceptualized in the capacity purchase agreement was, yes, it was primarily about cost savings, but we needed um, something to if, if essential air service goes away, if, if a global pandemic happens, um, that we had this in place uh, to prevent our communities from losing air service and going through the, uh, the rigor, rigor morale of, of rebuilding service in small communities. Um, and we're securing those air, those, those resources, those aircraft, those pilots um, for Wyoming uh, instead of sending those aircraft somewhere else. Mr. Chairman, uh, getting to some of the exciting stuff here, this is a, a summary of an update on some of the fiscal year 2019 expenditures from the Air Service Enhancement Program. There are four projects that were still ongoing the last time we met about a year ago. Um, Cody Yellowstone had a, a grant for Chicago Hair Service um, that performed extraordinarily well. Uh, it, it returned uh, $93,000 to the Air Service Enhancement Program um, and delivered 1,500 additional passengers to the state. Uh, Riverton and Sheridan required some grant amendments so that they, they had enough funding to bridge uh, their former carrier uh, into January of 2020 so that they could transition uh, easily to the capacity purchase agreement and with United and SkyWest. Uh, and then finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, Rock Springs uh, required no amendment in terms of dollar amounts, but did require an amended term of about three months uh, to bridge them over to the capacity purchase agreement, which started uh, for them October 1st. Mr. Chairman, uh, taking a look at uh, the Air Service Enhancement Program expenditures for fiscal year 2020, uh, there's two grants in here for Cheyenne. The first one was they were uh, awarded a grant for service uh, on American Eagle operated by SkyWest to continue service to Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, as COVID-19 unfolded, that no longer became uh, tenable and the, the airport and uh, their local air service development organization made the decision to go ahead and suspend service uh, and kind of save save everybody a, a little bit of money here and um, restore service when when the timing seemed correct. And that goes into the second grant um, in, on November 11th. United will start flying into uh, back into Cheyenne, and we awarded a grant from the Air Service Enhancement Program of 527,000 uh, to provide service on United Express operated by SkyWest uh, to Denver. 
Uh, and then the, the last fiscal year 2020 uh, grant was for Jackson Hole and JH Air. Um, and due to COVID-19, uh, that required the entirety of the grant to be expended. And Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and stop for any questions at this point. Senator Bebout, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, to look at the, the most recent graphs, I have a couple of other questions, but when you look at those in the, uh, the Cheyenne to Denver, and of course, when Great Lakes did that, there was a real issue of dependability and delivery, deliverability. Uh, what is the market? I mean, it's looking like, you know, I talked to a lot of people in Cheyenne and of course the good thing that's happening for, for Sky West is the traffic jams starting at Fort Collins all the way into DIA are helping, but uh, is, how's that market looking? It seems to me that that's a tough one to get on a plane to fly for 25 minutes and then get and then try to make connections rather than just driving. Give, give me a little bit more background on that, if you would, please. Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, it's uh, the, I, I call this the, the Swiss Army knife of service. It's um, is it is it perfect for where everybody wants to go? No. Um, however, Denver is the premier connecting hub in the region. You saw that with United that you drop a flight into into Denver, you can connect to the 170 plus destinations out of there. Um, and that's and that's a lot easier than um, you know flying to Dallas, backtracking to Seattle or to the West Coast. The predominant uh, number of des top destinations out of Cheyenne are on the West Coast, uh, so this makes connections a little bit easier for them for that. Um, and too often, you know, we forget that the majority of our traffic is coming here to visit, um, and to them, it's it's just a connecting flight. It's um, you know, it's, they don't look at it as, as, well, yeah, it's just easier to, to hop in my car as I've kind of been conditioned to do. It's, I need to get to Cheyenne uh, to do business. So I'm gonna go and go make a connecting flight. Well, Mr. Chairman, the other question- Follow up. Is, yeah, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman. Uh, so we, we decided to use the air service enhancement rather than the CPA. And looking back at uh, when we first set this up, I. They probably weren't discussing that for a flight. Why would we use the enhancement rather than a CPA? Is it because of the short term versus the longer term agreements with CPA? Is that the rationale? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Bebout, uh, a little bit. You know, the, the capacity purchase agreement wasn't really designed with Cheyenne in mind. Uh, Cheyenne, I think, had um, some other ambitions at, outside of Denver uh, due to COVID uh, that kind of came back into the fold of, you know, yes, it's, 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 it's a good option at the moment. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at, you know, rolling them back in. We, we did get some financial relief from first CARES Act money that I'll, I'll, I'll talk to a little bit uh, here, but, you know, it, it layering Cheyenne on top of the capacity purchase agreement would kind of, uh, Put a little bit financial more financial stress on it um so right now it's the air service enhancement program however we'll, we'll continue to keep an eye on transitioning it if it seems appropriate and the last question Mr. co-chair about this is on the budget side uh you know we didn't really anticipate this when we did that although we set aside some money is there any negative effect or budget consequences be, by now adding this this part to the uh, air enhancement program Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebout, uh, as far as adding Cheyenne back in? Right, I mean, we never we never talked about that having being part of the air enhancement, Mr. Co-Chair. Now they are, and we're gonna grant them some money. What is the effect on our budgets? Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebout, um, if, you, if you look at the, the American Airlines uh, first grant there, um, the state match was, was 30%. Uh, it, traditionally, we've, we've offered up to 60%. Um, this is because the, the community kind of banded together and really came up with a, a larger um, local share than some some other communities had. So um, it, it's it's kind of we, we've put them in as a placeholder kind of going forward. Um, and I, I think the, the air service enhancement program still has the ability and the carryover to still accommodate them, at least for the short term. 
Thank, one last question, in, Mr. Co-Chair. I'm trying to get a number on the actual employments. And one graph shows two, 2019 around 750, and another one shows it up to around 850. What is the actual total employments for Wyoming for 2019? You look at you look at the graph on page five. It shows. 219 around 850 and you look at the graph on page nine and it shows 750 what, what's the real number yeah mr chairman um graph nine is only for the first six months of the calendar year um and then so graph graph two is probably what you or graph three or paid excuse me slide three is probably what you want um, it, it, this is, it's not in plain mints, but it's, it's total passengers. And usually you can kind of split this in half and, and get what it is in total in plain mints. So that would be 650, 670,000. Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebout, does that kind of make sense? This is total passenger, so it's a passenger getting on the aircraft as well as getting off the aircraft. Yeah, thank you. Senator Coe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question goes to Cheyenne, and clearly when you're talking about a 100-mile drive or a 100-mile flight, very comparable to what we we compete against up here with Billings. You know, it's very similar to what Gillette competes with Rapid City. Uh, I guess my question is on pricing. With this this MRG to SkyWest, who's operating the airplanes on behalf with the United Tail. I guess my question is, um, do we have any control over the over the prorate pricing uh, as it as it relates to Cheyenne, like if you're buying a Cheyenne DC and back prorate with United, you know, I'm just concerned about, you know, the hundred miles. If it's, if, if it's not competitive price wise, I think it's going to be very difficult to make it work. And I'm just curious how that all shakes out when it comes to pricing. When you start talking about a short flight, you know, 20, 25 minute flight from Cheyenne to DIA. So my question has to do with pricing. Go ahead, Mr. Burke. Sure, Mr. Chairman, uh, Co-Chair Co Co, Senator Coe. Um, what we did for Cheyenne was pretty much just proxy it to Laramie. Uh, Laramie's been this great story of just these that incremental increase that I was talking about. Um, and Cheyenne's about three times the market size of what Laramie is. So, yeah, and a little bit longer drive to Laramie, but um, the, the pricing is very competitive. So if you're if you're coming down, you know, in 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 January, I would say, and unless you know you uh, it, it, since you're leaving office, that you can you can make a flight from uh, Cody to to Cheyenne, and you can do it within four hours uh, versus you know six to seven hour drive. But it's um it, it is it is price competitively, um, and you know it, it, at the end of the day, we have to uh, in order to compete with it. Further questions? All right, seeing none, please proceed. Uh, expedite it as much as you can, knowing we are on a time schedule and we have another presenter that uh, is up here very quickly. Okay, hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, going into the capacity purchase agreement, this is a summary of the expenditures that were, were made in the four participating communities in Gillette, Riverton, Rock Springs, and Sheridan. Um, all that is 60% state match. And in every case, except for Rock Springs, there were some state dollars that were, were recovered. Um, and when you add up the, the state dollars recovered, it's uh, just over 155,000, 160,000 um, that were recovered back into the program. Uh, and this is before CARES Act money uh, was kind of injected into this. Hey, Mr. Chairman, talking about some of the highlights of the capacity purchase agreement, uh, as I said earlier, Gillette had its uh, its best fourth quarter ever when they started on the capacity purchase agreement in October. Uh, they had their best January and their second best February ever on record. Uh, Riverton had its second best February on record. Um, and Sheridan had its best February on record. 
uh, and more than and doubled their employments from 2019. Um, and prior to these, these slides kind of go into, into press, we didn't have the August 2020 numbers. Uh, Sheridan and Riverton both exceeded their 2019 employments uh, in August. So great success story there. Uh, capacity purchase agreement, uh, it, it's kind of the, uh, the tune of it has been more passengers, lower cost. Uh, we were able to reduce the per passenger cost by 60% in Sheridan and Riverton. Uh, combined, we were able to deliver 43% more passengers in those communities prior to COVID-19. Uh, and in, in all, it was a 9% reduction in overall costs that were delivered through the CPA. Mr. Chairman, this is a, um, and when, when you look at October and through February for Rock Springs and Gillette, where we had a good year over year comparison, uh, and then January and February for Sheridan and, and uh, Riverton, uh, the, this um, table kind of explains that we were able to implane uh, 9,000 more passengers for uh, $70,000, $75,000 fewer state dollars. Out. So again, it's, it's more passengers, lower cost, um, and we were able to deliver that uh, prior to uh, COVID-19. Um, and a little bit on some, some, some of the CARES Act money, uh, we were able to realize $4.2 $4 million in relief uh, to the capacity purchase agreement that was authorized by the governor's office um, to cover some of those additional expenditures that are going to be realized due to COVID-19 uh, to the capacity purchase agreement. Uh, that includes the state and local portion uh, and those funds can be used in, in the 10 month period from March, 2020 to uh, December, 2020. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I think that's all I had before it, um, it progresses to the, the airport improvement program. Are there any questions? Senator Bevout. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. On the, the CARES Act for the relief to the CPA, and realizing that the money, uh, you know, we get into whether the costs are incurred or, or how that is. Plus, you might have an extension if the Senate and the House ever agree and go into September 30th of next year. Uh, do you have a timeline on the expenditure of that 4.2 million, where it might go? And you don't need to to show me now if you could present that or forward it to this committee as well as to the Appropriations Committee as to how that will go out. I'd appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebout, we can certainly provide that to you. Do you have any quick comments on that or do you want to provide it in the future, Mr. Burke? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, we, we can provide it in the future. And my one quick comment, I guess, is that $4.2 million is, is what we anticipated from, from that 10-month that period of March through December. Um, it, it's, in, it's likely that we'll see some of that kind of uh, carry over, provided that we're given the authority to do so. Um, but that 4.2 million is what we predicted in kind of the worst case scenario, uh, what we would expend in addition to um, what we had anticipated to spend. Further questions? All right. Seeing none, go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may turn it over to Administrator Olson, he has an, an update on some of the CARES Act to the airport side and the AIP projects. Administrator Olson, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> On slide 25, uh, this is a different source of CARES Act funding. So th this, uh, this CARES Act funding came directly uh, to the airports in our state through the US Department of Transportation and then the FAA. Um, and as you'll recall, or maybe not, Congress set aside about $10 billion uh, in March uh, to be distributed to airports around the country uh, via this mechanism. Uh, the purpose of this funding was really to help airports remain operational through the COVID-19 pandemic uh, by providing some flexible funding for operations, maintenance, uh, and really a, a variety of uses. And then also it, it, another purpose was to increase the match on any fiscal year 20 federal grant uh, to 100%. Uh, so to date, uh, we've, we've received, our states received about 52.46 million uh, out of that 10 billion. And a small portion of it will be used for airport development and the majority of it will be used for airport operations as you can see. Uh, next slide. 
Um, I've received a request to bring in um, Delta for a moment. Would that be appropriate? That would be appropriate, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to just continue through these quickly or? I'll go ahead. And... Or do uh, you Kayla, did, did Delta want to speak right this second or are they just in the ready to be part of the meeting? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm looking to clarify. The request was pretty brief. Um, I got the impression that they're, um, they might have something to say related to something that Mr. Burke has spoken about thus far. Sounds good. Well, as soon as they get here, we'll hear from them. Until then, Brian, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on slides 26 through 30, um, I, I just thought I would include a list of the projects that we've been working on this year, uh, construction projects, as well as a list that's planned for next year. Um, and I won't go into any detail, uh, these are for your use, but I will point out a couple of items. If you look on these lists, say on slide uh, 26, you'll see a project that says seal coat and mark pavement. So one of the things that we work on here in the division is we split the state into four quadrants um, and we, uh, each year we, we pick a quadrant and we do some preventative maintenance projects where we group together the airports in that quadrant and we do some crack sealing and we do some seal coating uh, really to extend the life cycle of our pavements. And it's the most prudent way to spend money on pavements is to take care of them when they're in good condition. Um, so uh, between our seal coat and our crack sealing, I, I was just running some numbers a few weeks ago um, versus doing each airport doing it individually, we save about $450,000 a year by, by doing those group projects. And then in addition to the seal coating, we do some markings. So we, we like to keep their pavement markings in uh, excellent condition um, for, from the safety aspect. And by doing that as a group project, we save about another $627,000 a year versus the airports doing it individually. So just wanted to point out uh, some of the group projects that we've been working on and, and our pavement maintenance and pavement management program at the airports. Um, and then uh, in addition, just a reminder, these projects are paid for with uh, federal mineral royalty funds. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll move on to slide 31. Mr. Chairman, it looks, never mind. We had Delta and we lost them again. <laughs> oh no, they're here. Um, if now is a good time to bring, nope, okay. I'm out of sorts here. Can go ahead and continue why that. <laughs> We're happy to be flexible. On slide 31, I just wanted to uh, include a list of terminal, commercial terminal projects that we've done in the past five years and kind of what we tentatively have planned in the next five years. And um, really, a lot of our terminals were designed uh, pre 9-11 and they were not designed to accommodate uh, TSA, TSA security equipment as well as they were designed for smaller aircraft. So we've, we've recognized that problem for a number of years and we've been working uh, pretty diligently to make sure that our terminals are functionally able to handle both larger aircraft and um, increased frequencies of aircraft. So. Um, new terminal in Cheyenne, Laramie's in the process of uh, rehabilitating and, and, and expanding their terminal. Um, and then Sheridan, that's the picture of the secure room right there. Uh, they added onto their terminal and, and have a nice secure area now. And then due to the um, very uh, strong growth in Cody, uh, we'll be looking at that, expanding that terminal. Uh, Rock Springs is, is just getting ready to kick off their terminal uh, reconstruction, rehabilitation. And then um, Casper and Jackson as well are looking at some terminal projects over the next five years. Uh, next slide. Uh, so some, this is just a, a little good news story I wanted to pass along. So uh, back in 2018, uh, Congress started setting aside some extra discretionary funding for airport construction projects. 
uh, above and beyond what they would normally set aside. And over the years, the last two to three years, we've worked really close with the FAA uh, to put forward some quality projects that compete well for funds in our state. And um, we've been very successful, included on this slide are just a couple projects for 2021 construction. Uh, but over the last three years, we've I think we've had about six or seven projects that we've competed for and, and won. And oftentimes that's a 100% match on those funds. Uh, I think we've received a total of about $31 million in, in supplemental discretionary funds for airports around the state. So uh, working hard on bringing some of that federal money in and, and doing some good quality projects. Uh, next slide. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, uh, just wanted to brief the committee on where we're at on our economic impact study. As you'll recall, we started this um, over a year ago and uh, it takes a good deal of time to uh, do the surveying to really understand the way in which our airports are being used. And we like to do a full year of that so we, we get every season in the surveying data. Uh, we did complete that, fortunately, uh, pre-COVID-19. Um, so it will be uh, data before COVID-19. Um, and we're, we've been working on with the uh, consultant on getting those numbers analyzed and getting the report put together. We're slightly ahead of schedule. We anticipate finishing that um, before the end of the year and um, we'll have that data available at that time. The last study was completed in 2013. So we are looking forward to having new data We'll also, as part of that, have a, an update on the return on investment study for air service, as well as we're working on a baseline study on the impact of UAS on our state as well, so that we can sort of track that in the future. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to stand for any questions. Senator Bebout. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Yourself, uh, myself, Senator Von Flader, and we're all very interested in general aviation. And, and that's a big part of, I think, what's going on in our country with what's happening with commercial air service. Are there any general comments that uh, they might share with us about the importance of general aviation? And of course, when we upgrade the airports, we do things in that nature. It helps all of us. But anything else on general aviation? Especially Mr. on our runways, right, Mr. Co-Chair? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Please Senator, uh, um, I would say generally, you know, on um, general aviation, we are we're very strong for general aviation. And as you look through the list of projects, uh, we have a lot of projects going on at our general aviation uh, airports. I would say that general aviation probably rebounded stronger um, during the COVID-19 pandemic than uh, commercial service did. And we're thankful for that. I mean, we've seen pretty strong GA come back. Um, and then, um, but overall, we our priority rating model um, uh, takes good care of General Aviation Air Force and, and we're very thankful for them uh, with all the fires that have been happening and, and, um, and there's been a lot of firefighting activity in our GA airports. So uh, they provide an extremely valuable part of our uh, air transportation system. Mr. Chairman. Senator Von Fladern. Thank you. Mr. Olson, did the um, Wheeland ever get straightened out as far as their runway and the paving job they did on that? Mr. Chairman, Senator uh, Von Flattern, uh, it has been straightened out. Um, we did, um, the contractor ended up replacing all of that uh, asphalt paving that was out of spec. I, I attended the uh, grand reopening and ribbon cutting on uh, August 29th. And uh, there was a fly-in as well. And it was a very nice event. The runway looks beautiful, taxiway looks beautiful. And um, I think they're quite happy. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Uh, I will say on, in regards to general aviation, um, the charter business did come back a little quicker than commercial. And uh, we are flying a couple three days a week so we're good on that as far as charter business versus commercial that's good news 
Glad to hear that. Any further comments or questions? All right. Uh, knowing that we have uh, Delta Airlines ready in the wings and waiting, uh, why not? I think you're sticking around through their presentation. If folks have further questions on the presentation YDOT just gave, maybe we could pick those up at the uh, end of the meeting after Delta's presentation. But with that, uh, Kayla, if you would let in all the Delta folks that need to be let in, we would go ahead and move on to the Delta presentation. Uh, but committee, remember, uh, we can come back to YDOT here at the end of the meeting as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Olson, Mr. Burke, and, and Director Reiner for being here today. And uh, We'll talk to you again in a few minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Martin, I think we're ready for you. If you're the lead or if one of your cohorts is, you just let us know and we'll follow your direction. Um, I am, um, and thank you very much for having me. Sorry about the uh, technical glitch um, earlier. Um, Kayla, would you let me know, Are you, do you need me to share my screen for the presentation or will you be loading that? Uh, Ms. Martin, you do have the capability to share your screen for a presentation, but if you prefer, I can run it. Um, if you can run it, that might be easier. Certainly, it'll be just a moment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, while we're waiting, I forgot to mention that uh, Representative McGuire is also a very qualified pilot. I don't want him mad at me. In fact, you know that McGuire actually taught me how to uh, fly or instruments. Small world in Wyoming. Well done, Representative McGuire and Senator Von Flater. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the select committee, if you can see my screen, then I think we're ready. Okay. We can see your screen, so go ahead, Ms. Martin, and just tell Kayla when you want her to move from uh, slide to slide. Appreciate that. Um, thank you, Kayla, and um, thank you, Chairman Cohen Walters and members of the committee for having me today. Um, I'm Amy Martin. I'm Delta's Managing Director for Domestic Network Planning with responsibility for our flight schedules for the United States and Canada. And with me, I also have Michael Velton, who is my General Manager for Network Planning with responsibility for the West as well. Um, I have a brief update and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have as well. The next slide, Kayla, please. So at Delta, um, we really know that if people don't feel safe, they won't be coming back to flying. So as we fight the pan pandemic, we really have put our emphasis on prioritizing people, and that is both for our customers as well as our employees. So with that, we've launched what we're calling the Delta Care Standard, which is our industry-leading commitment to cleanliness and safety. Um, so with this, we are implementing advanced cleaning protocols to provide cleaner air, surfaces, and spaces interior. We're promoting social distancing by blocking middle seats and limiting capacity on board, which is something that we've heard is very important to both our customers and our employees. And we're requiring masks for both of our customers and our employees um, and finding ways to reduce touch points both on the airport as well as on the plane. We're also giving our customers peace of mind with enhanced flexibility in their travel plans. Um, certainly I think all of us don't have a crystal ball and it's, it's really, um, been challenging for, for many of us, airline planners included, to be making plans too far in advance. 
So um, as we're taking this very seriously, we have dedicated significant resources with our first ever global cleanliness division to really help us stay abreast of the latest technology and protocols. And we're teaming up with experts such as the Mayo Clinic and Lysol. Um, and we are also been one of the first companies to test our entire workforce to make sure COVID-19 to make sure that we're keeping everyone safe. The next slide, please, Kayla. Um, so we also know, as I mentioned before, that we know it's this year, it's very challenging to make advanced plans, especially with changing travel restrictions, COVID-19 outbreaks, and a lot of folks having uncertainty about work and school plans. So we've been committed to offering as much flexibility for our customers as possible. We've extended flight credits through September, 2022. Um, we've eliminated change fees for all of our domestic travel. And um, I think something that many of our customers really value, we've extended the Sky Miles medallion status through January 31st, 2022, so that no one who doesn't feel safe traveling right now um, loses some of their hard won status. Um, we're also, as I've been said before, we're making all efforts to ensure that we're keeping travelers safe throughout the journey. Um, at the airport, we're doing as much as possible to make our surfaces touch or make um, the travel experience touch free. Um, one of the ways we're doing that is by utilizing our Fly Delta app to allow passengers to check in and receive flight updates and without having to speak with customer service agents or um, go to kiosks. Um, again, we're requiring masks for our customers and employees and we're taking temperature checks for our employees. Um, we also have a new Delta screening tool for our all employees who will be coming into work to make sure that they're symptom free before they go up in front of the public. Um, we've also been revamping our Sky Clubs to limit capacity. And if you've been tra if you've traveled at Delta to recently, you notice that we've probably got more um, packaged food options, moving away from the prior buffet style into something that's a little safer and more socially distant. Upon boarding, um, we are using electrostatic spraying before every flight and sanitizing all touch surfaces. And we're also, we've updated our boarding um, policy to board from the back to the front to minimize passengers touch, passing each other as they're boarding or deboarding the, the airplane. Um, on board, we've offering it's pared down food and beverage options and using trays to minimize contact with our customers and the flight attendants. And then upon arrival, we're also using the electrostatic spraying in our baggage claim areas to make sure that those areas are also safe from the virus. Thank you, Kayla. Um, even before COVID-19, Delta has been investing in technology to keep our passengers informed. And we've really been able to leverage those investments to boost travelers' confidence in these uncertain times. Um, upon checking in, travelers are asked to confirm that they are free of symptoms and agree to wear a face mask while traveling. We've been trying to use um, every touch point and every communication possible to make sure that passengers are aware of our face mask policy before arriving at the airport. Um, in our Fly Delta app, you can also use your phone to access boarding passes, receive travel notifications, as well as check Sky Club availability. And we're utilizing the app to send alerts to notify travelers when the airport aircraft has been sanitized and inspected, um, as well as sending recommendations for safe deboarding when landing. Um, and one thing also that we had prior to COVID-19, but that many passengers appreciate is the app will also alert you when your baggage has arrived, um, which is something that gives a lot of people a good peace of mind. Um, now, one of the things I think is really very important and, and what we're trying to make sure that our, our passengers know is that we've really been the industry leaders on working with our engineers to improve our onboard air, air filtration system. So with our new um, updated systems, all cabin air is replaced with new air every two to five minutes. And the new air is a combination of fresh outside air that enters through the air engine compressors and passes through an air conditioner with a HEPA filtered recirculated air. The HEPA filters that we use remove 99.99% of particles, including viruses, um, as well as bacteria and fungi, which are also helpful to remove. And these filters are really similar to the ones that are being widely used right now in hospital rooms and surgical suites. Um, this gives a continuous uninterrupted airflow on the cabin 
keeps the cabin air from being stagnant. And this both makes the cabin air a lot safer as well as more comfortable for our passengers. So um, moving on from some of the safety measures um, and turning back to our network, as we work through the pandemic, we are really heavily relying on our four core hubs. And for Delta, those four core hubs are Atlanta, Detroit, Minneapolis, and Salt Lake City. These four core hubs are really built for um, connecting traffic. And we've been making sure that we've got 360 degree of coverage in each of four of these to make sure that we get our passengers where we need to go. Um, one thing that we've been um, previously um, kind of in a pre-COVID world, Delta had been um, more heavily weighted in market share for the Eastern part of the US than the West. Um, but that's something that we've been investing heavily in trying to build up our position in the West. And one of the ways we've been doing that is through building a world-class hub in Salt Lake City. And we are, even with the pandemic, we're continuing these efforts this year. Um, Salt Lake City is actually very well geographically positioned to carry traffic from the Eastern half of the US to the West. And it's our primary hub for the mountain states, including Wyoming. Um, this fall, we're serving 83 destinations from Salt Lake City with 225 daily flights, and we'll be flexing up the schedule for expected upticks in demand for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, for Wyoming, um, via Salt Lake City, we offer three destinations. Um, we offer daily service to Cody through September, twice daily service to Casper, both of those are on SkyWest, as well as three times daily service to Jackson Hole. And we'll be expanding the Jackson Hole service for peak winter by adding a nonstop flight to Atlanta on the 757, a fourth flight to Salt Lake City, um, with all of those being on the 319. And then this weekend, we'll be loading um, a new Los Angeles and Minneapolis to Jackson Hole flights for the Christmas holiday. Um, we're also very excited to be upgrading our Salt Lake City experience um, with, a, with a new facility, and this is providing a best-in-class airport experience. And we look forward to having all of you fly, fly through it and, and check, it, check it out. The first phase of the $4 billion new facility opened on September 15th to great reviews, and the second phase is slated for 2024 to 2025. The new, as you can see from the pictures, the new terminal is large and spacious, um, offers beautiful views of the Wasatch Mountains and upgraded dining and shopping options. Um, the design is actually inspired by Utah's famous slot canyons, as you can see from the picture in the middle. Um, we actually have some really uh, nice lighting options too to, to really make that a, a very beautiful entryway. Um, the new facility is also better equipped for Delta's current fleet with more flexible gating and improved aircraft movements to improve our operation. And we are particular, particularly proud of the new 28,000 square foot Sky Club in Salt Lake City, which is now the largest in our system and also features an outdoor sky deck with views of the mountains and the runway. So um, to conclude, we're proud of the presence we've built in the Western US and we look forward to providing passengers traveling to or from the great state of Wyoming with safe, convenient and best in class travel experience on Delta Airlines. Questions for Ms. Martin. I'd just like to point out how important uh, Wyoming is to Delta Airlines and that they send Miss Martin who is a very high up in their chain of command. And so we certainly appreciate Delta's commitment to Wyoming. And so thank you for being here today. Senator Ako. Yeah, just a comment for Miss Martin and, you know, pass on my regards to Joe Esposito. Um, I'm a long time, like a 25 year friend with Bob Cortello, even though he's retired and, and We've had a partnership here in Cody with SkyWest Delta since 1994 with the Brazilias. And, and uh, so I just want you to know how, how we respect Delta as a airline partner in the state of Wyoming. And thank you for all you do. Appreciate it. And I'll, I'll pass along those regards to Mr. Esposito as well as Mr. Cortell, you. Senator Guru, did you have a comment? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, no, just echo the, the comments from Senator Coe and that we're all, all of us in Wyoming, um, 
are gratified by your service. I know that the um, Casper folks are excited about the service there and, and always in Cody and of course in Jackson, um, you have a lot of dedicated and loyal flyers and I happen to be one of them. And, uh, um, and so we appreciate, we appreciate the service and appreciate you being here today. Thanks. Further questions for Ms. Martin. Okay, well, again, thank you for being here today. And we certainly appreciate Delta's partnership with the state of Wyoming and can look forward to many years in the future of this continued relationship. Well, Do you have anything you. you'd like, anything you'd like to offer to wrap things up? I, I'd just like to say that we also very much value the partnership that we've built with the great state of Wyoming. Um, We've been pleased to be able to partner with um, all of all of y'all and trying to make sure that we can maintain air service and get passengers where they need to go, even during these difficult times. And um, we look forward to being able to rebuild our service and make sure that as demand recovers, we're there right there with you. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, thanks for being here. And with that, uh, Committee, we can go go back to uh, YDOT. We kind of hustled through the end of their presentation. Were there any further questions for YDOT on any of the information that they provided? Hopefully everyone, uh, yes, Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I think my question goes back to the CARES Act money. I think if I remember right from that slide, it was roughly, 52 million um, uh, gained separately uh, uh, from the uh, federal government. And so my concern is, do you believe that uh, 49 million, I think was roughly the number for operations? Um, will we get that spent so that no dollars have to be returned? In, in your opinion. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Representative Sweeney, I believe so. There is, that money does not have to be spent before December 31st. It, I think it has a four year window. So the airports have about four years on the operating money. If they use it for development, they also do have to spend it in four years on the development side as well. But there we, you know, really the airport that's probably gonna do the most development with it would be Cody. And we have, uh, they have a good plan in place to get it all spent. So I'm, I'm very confident that that money will get spent in the state. Follow up representative Sweeney or that makes sense. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. This uh, goes a long way of making just a few comments since I think we're wrapping up, but uh, uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, simply thank everybody and uh, just bring to everybody's attention that uh, there has been a, an approval by the FCC to move forward with 5G reception. It was pushed forward by a company called Legado, L-I-G-A-D-O, and it's ground-based 5G reception for your phone, which is great for all of us who are in uh, rural areas. The problem is it's been shown and proven that it uh, interferes with air-based GPS reception, especially when aircraft are on a precision approach. And the Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association has been leading the fight on this. Unfortunately, big money, and by that I mean the uh, networks who control the cell towers, are winning the fight on that. And it's a real danger to us because a couple months ago, uh, I was calling everybody because the FAA had uh, proposed to consolidate and eliminate a lot of our non-precision ground-based approaches. That's VOR and uh, uh, approaches. There was included one ILS approach and several NDB approaches. Well, that's a two-edged sword. If we lose our ground-based approaches and we find out that our GPS approaches are in jeopardy, well, then what do you do? I mean, we've got to have approaches, and Wyoming is quite unique in so far as everybody here knows, it's a long way from one airport to the other. 
I mean, if you go into Riverton, you miss the approach in Riverton, it's 12 o'clock at night, where are you going to go? It's a long way to go find another precision approach. It's a long way to go find good weather. It's not like back east where if you miss the approach into one airport, well, you got another one five miles away or 10 miles away. We're talking for the airplanes that I fly, we're talking about an hour and cruise to get to another airport. And uh, it's important for our air transportation or for our commercial air service. And so far as if you go, if you have a commercial aircraft and they need to go somewhere else, well, they can't just go anywhere. They have to go somewhere where there's a terminal and where there's crash fire rescue and there's weather reporting and there's a precision approach. Uh, so that really starts narrowing things down. We're talking about a limited number of airports and some airports shut down certain services at different times of the night. So uh, I guess my comment would be, we're all kind of in this together. It's important for us to protect our approaches. It's important for us to protect our US customs. And we've got one port of entry in the state of Wyoming. And I see all the time, that just for whatever reason, the majority of the directional drilling companies are based out of Canada. And they come into Casper, they clear customs, and then from Casper, they go out to wherever those drillers are working around the state of Wyoming, land again, and, and let those people off the airplane. So uh, I would encourage us, we need to stand together. We need to be uh, sensitive to those things that are affecting all of the, any of the airports because ultimately they affect all of us. Uh, and finally, I'd like to say thank you again to YDOT for uh, taking care of our crack seal on surface, uh, asphalt surfaces. Uh, here in Casper, we've got some asphalt services that were not taken care of in the past. And unfortunately, they have degraded to the point where you can't just crack seal them. You can't save them. You're going to have to tear it up and remill it and uh, relay that asphalt. And that is extraordinarily expensive. It's not like just going out on a rural street or a, a, a parking lot. You have to do it per the FAA and you have to do it per spec. So those areas are probably lost forever. So again, I would encourage all of us, we've got to protect what we've got and we have to protect it vigilantly. And if one airport needs some help with the FAA or whatever, uh, what's good for one is good for all, and we all need to be on the team because uh, as a rural state, you know, there are a lot of other places that are fighting for those same aviation dollars. And thank you very much to the director and to Brian Olson. Uh, you guys bring it home, and that's so important for us, and we could not survive without those dollars. So thank you very much. Director Reiner and Mr. Olson, uh, can you follow up with Mr. McGuire uh, after working with the federal partners on those approach issues that uh, Representative McGuire was discussing just now, what the federal side is doing to make sure that those approaches aren't lost? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it's, yeah. you go, go ahead, ahead, Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, there's two parts of that I can offer on the ground-based approaches. The FAA sort of dropped that as far as I'm aware, I did check into it after the fact, but I will follow up on the 5G aspect of it. Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, certainly we will. You know, the 5G has been a frustrating thing for us in, in many components because the FCC really has not listened to input from states across the board. Because on the ground transportation side, uh, Wyoming was a leader in connected vehicle technology. In fact, we, we have an experiment going on as we speak and it used a spectrum that's being negatively impacted by 5G. And so just across the board, it just seems like almost uh, in this case, an unwillingness of, of the federal government to, to listen to input uh, from states and from locals. So, but we'll certainly, uh, we got the note, we'll follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any further comments, committee? Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, uh, 
not being a pilot, I have a hard enough time driving in a car. Um, but uh, I, having been um, an alternate on here is uh, really uh, brought me up to speed on a lot of different issues. But uh, having been in the hotel business uh, and hospitality business has afforded me an opportunity to meet, meet Hank and Eli and Michael V um, years ago and worked on tourism issues uh, through the years. And of course, with Grant Larson, what a champion for tourism uh, and the state, uh, he, he will be missed. Um, but likewise, uh, the good senders, um, your, your time uh, has been remarkable. Uh, and, uh, and to Michael V, uh, I, I, I hope uh, your forced retirement uh, won't chase you away. Uh, um, we're, we're trying to fight fight that element um, across the board in the state. And uh, uh, I, I'm just very thankful to all of you. Um, on the Senate side, I would ask um, if you can put a bug in the ear, um, uh, you've got a, a very talented Senator uh, that um, it's gonna, take a lot to replace uh, the three gentlemen in the Senate that are going off. And I would hope leadership would look beyond the R and the D um, on the replacement of the um, co-chairman on this committee uh, so that the Senate's got uh, some great expertise uh, to follow up on. Uh, so. But with that, thank you very much for your uh, remarkable service uh, to the state. And, uh, uh, and uh, Co-Chairman Co, uh, you, you did pretty good with uh, um, picking an airline partner um, uh, for uh, your real life partner, so. Uh, with Kerry, so who I served on with the tourism board years ago. So she's a remarkable woman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sweeney. Uh, any further comments, thoughts? Thank you to the folks at YDOT. Did you have any, uh, the folks at YDOT have any follow-up as a, again, we rushed out of your presentation into the Delta presentation. Did you have any uh, remarks that you would like to make to wrap up what your, your presentation? Uh, Director or Brian? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, just thank, say thank you. And uh, it's been a good ride and good discussion. And uh, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're in this business of transportation, air, ground, you know, across the board. And, uh, and, and we will keep working it hard and we appreciate the partnership of this committee and, and certainly the legislature. Very good, thank you. Senator Coe, I see you had your hand up a moment ago. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I just wanted to thank, thank Pat, Pat for his comments. It meant a lot to me. I've, I don't know how long I've known you, Pat, probably 25, 30 years plus, but thank you very much. And I guess I'd add, uh, uh, do we have any public comment on, on any of this or do we have anybody out there, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Kayla, can you check the waiting rooms and whatnot and uh, bring those folks in so they can offer any public comment on, on any of the YDOT or the Delta presentations? Uh, knowing that we hustled through those or switched from one to the next, but certainly would want to bring those folks in if they had questions for YDOT. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've pulled in um, everyone that's in the waiting room, so um, I leave it to you. All right, thank you, Kayla. I see a few folks have joined us, uh, Mr. Skinner, Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Hooper, 
anything you would like to add, offer, or ask of YDOT? All right, I'm seeing a lot of sas satisfaction here. Senator Coe, co-chairman. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to thank, you know, Bob Hooper is leaving at the end of September. And I wanted to thank him for his 25 years plus service and wish him all the best in the future. Best to you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Senator Coe. I appreciate your comments there. Congratulations, Bob. Thank you, Michael. Senator Guru. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Too, I wanted just to um, take on Pat, uh, Representative Sweeney. That um, um, was a great, very kind and generous words. And I just wanted to amplify too, um, you know, as putting on my Jackson Hole Air Improvement Resources hat, um, I got to work for a lot of years with this committee as as the chairman of that group and most notably with uh, Senator Von Flatern um, as um, in the Air Service Group. And I wanted to thank him um, for all of his service and for, um, you know, making it easy um, you know, working with him when I was with Jackson Hole Air and out of the Senate, um, it was always, he was always someone who I could go to and I appreciate that. Um, as for my uh, other two colleagues, Senate colleagues, um, I've actually known a lot longer than that. And um, Senator Bebout and Senator Coe and I go back a couple of different lifetimes. Um, when I was just way back when, when I was hanging out in the Capitol and these guys were, um, you know, really showing me the ropes way back when. Um, and it was a lot of fun when we were hanging out with H.L. Jensen and a lot of other folks, Charlie Maldonado. And I think back to, think back to that, it was just um, really, really a great time. And then actually then to be lucky enough to come back as a Senator and actually serve with them was, has been an honor and a privilege um, to be able to walk in. I'll never forget my first day on the Senate floor to be able to see even the three of them, the three gentlemen, um, to be see friends on the floor uh, was just incredible and an honor of my life. And so just wanted to say thank you. And uh, I know it's not goodbye. Uh, it's just uh, farewell for now. I know we'll be seeing you and uh, looking for your help and guidance and I'm sure you'll share it willingly. So um, thank you, thank you for your service. And if I don't get a chance to say it again, Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Thanks for the words, Mike. Further public comment or any other comments from the committee before we wrap up? Kayla, is there anything we need to do as we wrap up today? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, not that I can think of. Um, the only suggestion I had was public comment, which has been taken care of, so. Um, I can't think of anything else. All right, thank you. Senator Bebout. Yeah, one last thing, Mr. Co-Chair, and I appreciate all those kind comments and well, I'm gonna, gonna miss all of you, but I'm gonna rely on those House members that are on this committee and the new senators to be sure that we continue our air enhancement and CPA program for the good of Wyoming and all the communities affected. Very, very important and so I look forward to all of you carrying the banner and making sure that we have this effort be continued into the future. We've got issues, we've got problems, we've got shortfalls, we've got all of that, but we're gonna have air service and I'm gonna rely on all of you to make sure that happens and I know you will. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. Senator Coe, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to take us home. Okay, I just uh, you know wanted to say thank you to everybody. Uh, you know, I've been on the Select Air Committee since it was created, and I can't remember exactly when. Not real sure that Grant Larson didn't have something to do with it, uh, to be honest. And and it's been my distinct pleasure to serve with everybody. Thank you for everything. And uh, what Senator Bebout said, uh, uh, the House side uh, really needs to step up. And I'm looking at Representative McGuire and Representative Kenner and and you know Chairman Walters and. Anyway, I, I have nothing else to to bring to the committee except thank you, and it's been my pleasure serving with you on this committee. And uh, if there's no further comments, I guess I guess we can adjourn.
So moved. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Thank you to the committee. Have a great day. Thank you.